Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 104, Inaugural Review-a-Palooza, featuring breakdancing, hirelings, lasers, Batman, and a haunted coaster. <laughs> I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. You can join us Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. All right, welcome to our first ever review of Palooza. Uh, this is replacing this month's AMA, or Ask Us Anything, our live Q&A. In today's review field episode, we are going to be looking at one RPG, which is Runaway Hirelings, and four board games, including Breakdancing Meeples, Talisman Batman Supervillains Edition, Roll for Lasers, and Exit the Haunted Roller Coaster. As this is something new we're going to be doing, we would love to hear from you, letting us know what you thought of this new episode format. Hit us up on social media or send an email to mo at tabletopbellhop.com. Now, assuming this goes well tonight, this may become something we do a bit more regularly. Like, I'm thinking maybe once a quarter or perhaps every other month so we have a review of Palooza and then an Ask Me or Ask AMA the month in between. But we'll have to see how it goes. So please get your feedback in. If you hated it or loved it, we'd love to know. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interaction with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We appreciate comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media. I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX. Up first, a couple of comments based on our discussion of trying out playing an RPG online with Runaway Hirelings last week. Chris Groth says, I can definitely relate to the technical difficulties. Mm -hmm. First games always feel like that. What I found works best for me is trying to strip it back as much as possible. My preference is just video chat and have people roll actual dice. I trust them enough. Roll 20 I also don't mind. We use it for whiteboard and dice. Much more than that though, I find the interface far more distracting and the game gets lost. I also find the first couple of games way worse. There was definitely an adjustment period for me to get comfortable enough with online gaming to finally settle in and have fun. Now, Samuel Penn writes, Running RPGs online definitely takes practice. There are advantages and disadvantages to it, and the trick is trying to maximize the advantages and avoiding the disadvantages. Something like Roll20 can actually be an improvement in some respects for dungeon-delving games. Mm -hmm. You get all the fog of war, enforced line of sights, limited lighting that you don't get at the table, which can enhance the tactical aspects. We've had great success with D&D &D and Pathfinder on this. As GM, it takes a lot of time to draw maps and set everything up, though. Mm -hmm. For something like Blades in the Dark or Delta Green, it basically just gets used for rolling dice, tracking character sheets, and the odd handout. I've been running on Roll20 for about eight years, though, and how much I've relied on the features it <laughs> offers has changed drastically over that time. Well, thanks for the comments, both Chris and Samuel. I, I got to say that I should have had more time with Roll20 before we started the game. Like, I did prep some stuff ahead of time. I went through part of the tutorial, but I wasn't expecting it to take as long as it did, like well over an hour. Um, the tool does look really powerful. I got to say, like, especially when used for the full effects, like Samuel's talking about there, with like the fact it'll track line of sight and distances and range between things, and you can do lighting effects and all that. That's really cool. But when we used it, we were basically doing it the way chris mentioned as a whiteboard and we still had some technical issues and issues trying to figure out how to get things to work though to be honest our biggest complaint though wasn't about roll 20 though it was discord the discord chat just kept dropping on us so one of the recommendations i did get from people was to use the roll 20 chat and the fact that most people who quit using it they've improved it since so it's worth trying again i've heard maybe we'll do that next time yeah, certainly worth uh, worth a try. I mean, it's not going to be worse than Discord yeah. was. 
So up next, we've got a bunch of comments on what to do when you've got a bad rule book. Yeah, so this is an older one, right? So it's kind of weird to be talking about this, but know what happened was earlier in the week, I was working on Pinterest pins and I saw that one pop up for that article and I'm like, oh, I haven't shared that one in a long time, like a couple of years since it was written. So I'm like, I'm going to share it again. And I got to say, it definitely caught people's attention this time around. So I'm glad I did repost it. First, Tommy Brownwell says, I go and see if Board Game Geek fixed it. Yep. Now, Mark Graybill wrote to say, yeah, you mentioned wrong order for Shadowrun Beginner Box. And that's the problem I see most often with rules written by native speakers of the language the rules are in. They don't establish a context for the information they're conveying. Mm -hmm. And that was the uh, fifth edition Beginner Box. Yeah. Uh, good articles and good insights. Now, Ian Borchardt had an interesting suggestion we didn't cover. Read the foreign language translation. <laughs> if it was originally written in that language, the intent is often clearer. And if it wasn't, the translator generally asks the designer to clarify the tricky bits in the English rules if they had a problem interpreting it themselves. <laughs> this was particularly true with <laughs> final flight, uh, FFG games. And finally, local Windsor gamer and amazing fiddle player Frank J. Edgley writes, Almost all game rulebooks are absolutely terrible. Mm. Combine that with my laughable memory, and you have the answer to why I don't play more board games. Fair enough. Well, that's some great feedback there. Thanks, all of you, uh, Tommy, Mark, Ian, and Frank. Some good stuff here. I got to say, checking out Board Game Geek to me is the default answer nowadays. If you got a bad rule book, go on Board Game Geek. And even if the publisher hasn't put out an official errata, be sure there'll be fans of the game who have addressed any rule book issues and any questions that have come up. You'll probably even be able to get a fan rule book for games that are bad enough. Now, what I really liked here, though, was Ian's suggestion to find a different translation. That is not something I've thought of myself. Like, obviously, this is going to be more useful for people who know more than one language because they can find rule books in a variety of languages, but this actually can apply to native English speakers like me who don't really know anything else except maybe a smattering of French and a little bit of Japanese from some anime we watched. Uh, because many of the games I like, uh, Euro games, German games, were released in Germany first. Almost everything from Rio Grande and Mayfair games, which originally were released in German. And what you can often find are the original English translations of these rules that usually came out before the North American port comes out. And I do remember at least once looking up a rule to one, I think it was like Princes of Florence or something, one of the old Aaliyah big box games and finding a translation of the German rules that made more sense than the English rule book that was in the box. So that's a legit thing, though those who have players speak other languages probably have an even better chance at finding a clarification than that. Now, as for Frank's comments, thankfully, nowadays, pretty much every game has some form of video tutorial out there. How to play videos are just almost exploding. They've become, definitely become a thing. And there are a number of content creators out there making videos. So I got to admit, there are various quality levels. But there's no longer just the, the, the big three names in, in video game, or sorry, board game tutorials or video board game tutorials. There are tons of creators out there putting them out there. Though I got to say, the best answer, since um, Frank is in Windsor, would have to be to come to one of the Windsor Gaming Resource events and have someone like me teach you to play something new. But then we kind of need the pandemic to end before we can start happening that happening again. Absolutely. Now, finally, we heard back from Roger Malosh, whose topic of complexity creep and player skill we covered a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> Thank you so much for a thorough and informative answer to my question. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome, Roger. Thanks for the great topic. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. A few quick announcements before we continue. This is that point where we say, like, subscribe, hit the bell, and all that stuff. This channel has seen some strange but wonderful growth lately. <laughs> so, please, help continue that. The advantages we would see if we reached that partner level on YouTube go far beyond anything monetization-wise. Yeah, we, it, we'd probably make an extra $8 a month, but we'd be able to do things like different end cards and we could have captions in. And when we make a mistake in a video, we could have a big thing pop up and say, hey, Mo screwed up and say the proper way to do things. We would love to have those additional tools and we're so close. So hit subscribe, ding the bell, do all that fun stuff. And if you're not on YouTube, do all the stuff you can do there to show you like us too. 
Another thing you can do if you do dig us, which I hope you do if you're listening to this, is you can sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. This is a newsletter I send out on Wednesdays. Uh, first of all, to remind you that we're going to be going live at night, so you can join us here on Twitch, but also to recap everything we put out the week previous, because we put out a lot of stuff almost every day of the week. You can sign up by going over to TabletopBellhop.com and clicking right there in the sidebar, or go over to newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. All right, today, August 25th, should have been the last chance for everyone to enter our Gorinto giveaway. For some reason, this giveaway just has not been going smoothly. Uh, first off, there was an HTML issue where some mobile devices, including my own, couldn't even load the widget needed to enter. Well, we finally figured that one out, but it took us until last Thursday to do so. Yeah, so it should be loading on everyone's device, except half the and when you go there, at least in this last week, Rafflecopter was having some kind of serious problems. Now, this isn't just us. This isn't a mistake on our end. This is everyone who's been using Rafflecopter. Trust me, if you go on Twitter, there's a lot of people complaining and a lot of frustrated users there. Now, this one is completely out of our control. Short of canceling the giveaway and relaunching using another tool, which yeah. wouldn't be fair to the people who have already entered. So what we're going to do, officially being announced right now, is we are going to extend this giveaway one more week. As of right now, the HTML issue is fixed, and it seems like Rafflecopter has been stable for the last two days, so I think we're good. So if you've tried to enter and couldn't, that should no longer be a problem. If you forgot to enter, now you've got another chance. And if you were listening to this live on the day it drops on your podcast catcher, you've got one day left. So get over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on the pinned article. Uh, we do apologize for the difficulties we had for this one, especially to, to Mark at Grand Gamers Guild, who was awesome enough to donate our prize. So good luck to everyone out there. All right, today is the last Wednesday of the month, which means, or at least normally would mean, we are hosting an end-of-month AMA and live Q&A with our chat room. But we're trying something new this week with a review-filled episode instead. So tonight's topic swap is just a trial, so I want to make sure that everyone knows that next month we are going to be back with another AMA. That'll be at the end of September. September 30th, specifically. Now, while we love to have you here live, remember you can send us questions ahead of time to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Or send us a voicemail through Skype by calling sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. We love people who drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. If you are here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell with more chat and content that otherwise only our patrons get. Uh, today, I've got a package from the op that I'm going to open in the after show. For anyone who was with us last week, you should know what that is. Um, other than that, we got a little bit of chat going on about some new lighting. So we did have one upgrade. One of the upgrades we've been planning to make to the show is add some new lights. So my video should look better than ever this week. And if it doesn't, I'm sorry, that's just me. That's not our tech <laughs> issues anymore. I don't get much better than this. So we did have some talk on our new lights, but not a lot going on in the in the chat room tonight. I do appreciate everyone who has stopped by. Absolutely. And Ryan, uh, for those uh, who may have heard, uh, finally got all of his math trades in. So yeah. he's got a, a bunch of new games that he's getting to the table. Yeah, he's got a pile of new stuff. Like he's got his, he he basically ordered a pile of shame. He has his own pile of shame there. Not so little. Like that's significant. It's yeah. a lot of games. All right, I want to welcome everyone to our inaugural review of Palooza. Up first, we'll be tackling Runaway Hirelings, then moving on to Breakdancing Meeple. Then we're gonna have a short coffee break to give people a chance to grab a drink and use the facilities if they need it. When we get back, it's going to be all about the Dark Knight in Talisman Batman Super Villains Edition, followed by a roll for lasers, and finally an exit game, Exit the Haunted Roller Coaster. Now, after each review, we will check in with the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch, to see if they have anything to add about any of these games. Welcome to the game room. This episode, we're talking about Runaway Hirelings, an improv-heavy fantasy RPG from Thomas Nopicell. Before we start, though, we do need to acknowledge that Thomas provided us with a review copy of the print version of Runaway Hirelings. All right, so Runaway Hirelings is designed and written by Thomas A. Novacell. He did have some help from Jarrett Crater and Owen Kerr. It features art by Thomas A. Novacell himself. Runaway Hirelings started as a one-page RPG, which was released in 2016. A revised edition was written and released in 2018. 
This review is of the longer revised edition. Now you can get Runaway Hirelings as either a PDF or a softcover book. Uh, this review is in regards to the physical book version. There's not really anything to unbox or show off here, so there's no unboxing for me to point you to for this review. Yeah, the Runaway Hirelings, the copy I have, is a thin digest size book. Uh, clocks in at 42 pages, but interestingly is only 33 pages long. Uh, the back don't have anything on them. I have to assume this is something to do with drive through RPGs print-on-demand service, where they have to print at at least 42 pages. So there is a little bit of a blanky spot to draw and add some character notes in the back of the book. Uh, the book is black and white, uses a single column layout, and some text that's just a little smaller than I would have liked. There is a surprisingly high amount of artwork in this book. Like flipping through the book, I would say that it's more than half art, which is kind of cool. The art style is unique and slightly humorous, and I dig it. While there are no chapters in the book, it is broken up into a number of sections. So how about you quickly go through what we will find in Runaway Hirelings? All right, so the first thing introduces you to the game, and it does this by diving right in. So this is a, an RPG book or a game written for experienced players and game masters. You're not going to find anything here explaining what, uh, how, what 1D6 means or what different types are or what role-playing is. Instead, Thomas wastes no time and just dives into what the game is all about. And the core of this gameplay is explained, followed by a list of what's needed to play, which isn't much. All you need is a character sheet for each hireling, possibly two, some pencils, some scrap paper, and a couple six-sided dice. Like 2d6 should do you. Now, in this game, you're creating a dungeon as you go. This is done by a number of different rules, which are basically set up like moves and any powered by the Apocalypse game. The basic flow is that one player is going to give the name of the room. Another player is going to point out a problem that can be sensed in the room. Then the game's master, called a Dunark here, which is short for Dungeon Architect, will use those two prompts from the two other different players to describe the room, to come up with it. So then they're going to roll a D6 and determine a danger score. And then the players, the halflings, halflings, sorry, hirelings, are going to take actions to try to find the exit of this room and the entrance to the next room. When players have gotten past a number of threats equal to the danger score, the next room's revealed. These actions are repeated until you get to the final room, which follows the same rules with higher stakes. Now, one thing you have to know in this game is that you are not adventurers. You are not heroes. You are not, you're basically not competent. Unlike many games that are about competence porn, this is the opposite. You are playing hirelings, hirelings that don't have much skill, but more about that in a bit. Note that uh, just in case it comes up again, we yes. have been saying the word halflings in place of hirelings since this game arrived at yes. the bellhop's table in the very first time. So there are no halflings in this game. So please just understand that if you hear the word <laughs> halfling, we mean hireling. To be honest, I just realized we have an unboxing video of this. Because this is a surprise package I opened up. We actually do have an unboxing video of this. So you can see the art in Runaway Hirelings. If you head over to YouTube and search for Runaway Hirelings Tabletop Bellhop. And if I remember correctly, Thomas even linked it on his site. But I was just thinking RPG book. We don't do unboxings for most RPG books. But yeah, I think we have one. Where I called the game Runaway Hi Halflings the entire time. Because <laughs> I read the cover along. And I got to admit that cover art could be a halfling. And th that's another note, too, is, is uh, we haven't really gotten into character generation, but there are no races specified. There, you could be halflings. That's it. Just in my head, I just pretend they're always halflings, and we're all good. So as for uh, the next section is the rules of play, and these are broken down in a series of triggers and what to do when those happen. Again, this is like a Powered by the Apocalypse thing, where it's like when entering a room, do this. When a character helps another, do this. Uh, there are moves for discovery and finding new rooms, rules uh, for helping each other, doing stuff, rules for gold, hireling creation, and of course, hireling death. Now, I don't want to get into too much detail here on the podcast. You can read all that on the blog. But what I would want to do is highlight a couple of rules that really stick out to me and that are, that are important to this game in this setting. The first is the fact you are just hirelings. You are not adventurers. Each character type in the game is good at one thing and one thing only. And that one thing isn't always that useful. Like the slop cook can cook. The torchbearer can find things in the dark. And the peasant is pretty much good at not being noticed. And that's about it. None of these are actually good at doing adventuring style things like, say, fighting or casting spells. And this really is where you get into the meat of the entire concept. Unlike most games where you can or should assume that competence 
uh, is, is a basic level for all your characters. This is most assuredly not the case here. In fact, the opposite is true. You're here because you were needed to carry stuff for the mm. real adventurers. But now, you're on your own. Now, as for making these characters, you got a dead simple character creation system. I almost didn't want to cover it here, but some of this stuff here is important to understand the other stuff. There's seven different types in the book. You grab a sheet. Again, think Powered by the Apocalypse. Grab your um, archetype. I can't remember what they're called. Your playbook. But it's just one sheet. Uh, give your character a name. Pick a build question. So there's a few questions to answer. Give you some background. Pick one piece of equipment off the equipment list. Note none of this equipment's actually useful. And then note down that you have 15 gold. And gold is basically your health in this game. When you run out of gold, that's when your character expires. Well, silly, you can assume that these hirelings were desperate for funds, which is how they got into this position in the first place. So without anything to return home with, they'd rather not carry on. Yeah, I, do. I gotta admit, when we played, it didn't really come up, but I gotta admit, the use of gold is a little weird. I heard another actual play podcast where they kept talking about, like, when the monsters attacked, they would cut their purse, and they drop a few coins, and I'm like, I just ignored it. To me, it was an abstract, just as much as hit points are in Dungeons & Dragons. Now, the rules for doing stuff, that's your important thing, right? This is your, how do you know if you succeed or fail at something, is all about if the hireling that's acting is doing what they're good at or not. And it's going to take clever play and out-of-the-box thinking by the players to actually get these near-useless half-hirelings, Jesus, to come up with narrative reasons their skills can apply and actually be useful in each situation. What is wrong with me and hirelings and halflings? I apologize, That's Tom, why you, I put the note in there. <laughs> you, you, need, you need to write a follow-up called Runaway Hirelings, and uh, I don't know, the, the hairy foot move for if you want to move fleet of foot. Anyway, sorry. In general... If a hireling is doing what they're good at, if, if the players can come up with a reason that the slop cooks stew from yesterday is a way to get past the obstacle, they succeed. All they have to do is tell a story. Now, there are four different types of stories that are listed in the book, and the darn art picks one of those. Uh, the actual how they work, again, isn't important here. And then they do what they set out to do. But after the first four successes, each, each of the four story types is used, they success starts coming at a cost and this is a an economy in the game of flail points where you're going to earn and spend flail points in yes. order to succeed and see that for me this was the first little hiccup in the game i found because i felt that flail points weren't actually as easy to come by as they maybe should have so after those first four actions are taken you you can't try and succeed in this mm -hmm. method um unless you happen to have gotten a flail point along the way. Yeah. yeah, that's a big part of the game. And I don't know if if we didn't run it properly or if just the game's supposed to be brutal, that you're not supposed to get a lot of flail points and you're supposed to fail because that does come up with a, a rule where you can flail to flail. Or I, I again, it's, I'm not even saying hireling or halfling this time, but fail to flail where you choose an action where you should have succeeded, choose to fail, but you get a flail point. And I think that's supposed to be part of the comedy of the game. Plus, the neat mechanic and the fun part actually does come up with the next part, which is doing something that isn't your thing at all, which has the players describe what they're doing and then rolling a d6. And it's only on a five or six. On a five or six, despite all logic, your hirelings manage to succeed, and they get a bonus of asking the Dunark a question, which can give them some more information on the next scene. But with a four or less, disaster occurs. Each of the other players is going to describe how they think things went wrong, one of the possibilities of how things went wrong, and then the group decides on the best outcome of those. Now, failure comes with a significant loss of gold. Now, well, again, gold is health, so this is probably how you're going to lose character. So the, the holding the table for how they die is very penny for your thoughts, like which I like. Now, alternatively, again, going back to those flail points, is a player could spend two to succeed automatically at something they're not good at, which I don't even think that came up in our game. Now, this is actually where I think the game succeeds, and, and, and it's where the players should, uh, should get into the pocket and be playing in for the most fun, mm -hmm. right? So this, this not doing, not trying to, to fudge your one actual ability into every nickel and cranny. No, no, just do something else and roll with the failure. And that's yeah. where the game can really sort of come into its own. I agree. Now, another thing I do want to highlight is how character decks work, because this is important. For one, it's expected. 
like Sean said, you don't get enough flail points to succeed at everything. You have to fail to get to the end of the dungeon. It is going to happen. This is a game where you basically get three lives, which I keep thinking about paranoia anytime I think of a game with lives, but these aren't quite clones. After your first character perishes by losing all the gold, you make a second. This character is made basically the same as the first, but you only get 10 gold, and your build question changes. So here's a very specific one, which is, why were you left behind or forgetting, forgotten on the way in? Now, if your second character doesn't make it either, which is, again, possible, you do get one more shot. This part I thought was awesome, because you grab your first character sheet again, because they weren't actually dead. I'm not dead yet. One of their items has been changed in some way, but your original is back, but only five gold left. Right. So the mechanic mechanics required for character rebirth are interesting, especially because of the way that question, the sort of that, that rounds out your character, changes through uh, through the steps uh, and you know explains things and adds more uh, depth to the story and more fun to the game as a result now the book also contains some advice for the the gm the dunark including how they should stock the dungeon how to determine that danger score which really is a d6 uh and that dungeon danger score is how many actions the players have to take before finding the next room. Note it's not successes, it's actions, which is an important part of the game too. How to start the session and stuff, which includes some world building, which can be important later. Now, the rest of the book is the seven different hireling types, uh, just because people will probably want to know. There's the trap poker, the torchbearer, the peasant, the chronicler, the fool, the itinerant monk, and the slop chef. Each hireling gets its own page and a piece of art that goes with it. And rules for each include uh, starting equipment they have, and it's all unique. And then what each hireling special is, specialty is, and then a set of build questions, one of which is answered during character creation. So in case you haven't quite caught on yet, this is not your classic no. RPG. No, and that was the problem when I first read this, because I got to say, I was intimidated by this. Like, this is a small book, right? I shouldn't get scared of it. I would rather read Dungeon Crawl Classics, which is 400 pages. I'm more comfortable with that, because I am much, very much a traditional role-playing gamer. Like, I'm in my 40s. I have been playing RPGs since the 1980s. I am used to crunchy games with lots of rules, and more importantly to the, this, as far as comfort level goes, is games that require substantial preparation time before play. I'm also used to being the game master, the god, the one responsible for all the world building and the narration, and I got to come up with everything. Now, I have been playing a number of newer games in recent years that are a little more improv heavy, but this super improv heavy, like 100% improv, shared narration, like this games like Runaway Hirelings are still kind of outside my wheelhouse. This is a game that rewards not only mechanically, but even your enjoyment your ability to think fast and roll with the punches, both as a player and as a Dunark. If you're the type who prefers a more quiet style, rolling for your attacks and actions, and being guided along by the adventure in the book or in the mind of the GM, then this either isn't for you, or you'd better be prepared to learn a whole new <laughs> skill set. Yeah, no, I agree completely. Uh, the other thing that's a little weird, like I found this off-putting, was the way the rules are written in this book and the order. Like, I recognize the format. I have played some Powered by the Apocalypse game. I own Dungeon World. I own Apocalypse World 2nd Edition. I've seen this before. I've seen the move format. I And I get it, but, like, I just had a hard time with the order they were presented and the piecing what went where. And it was just rough. Like, even Thomas notes it in his notes that at the beginning, it basically says... These moves are presented in the order that might come up. Read through them all, then read the setup rules, then go back and reread all the moves so you can see how they work together. Like, I'm just not used to having to read a book twice to figure out how all the pieces fall together. Yeah, and while certainly not how we are used to an RPG guide, it does reinforce the difference of this game, and that forced second reading could help some folks really get a hold of what it, what it is yeah. they're about to undertake. Now, personally, what I did, I did read it. Actually, I read it more than twice because I prepped for playing this a few times. But what I really helped it sink in, what really got me to grok it was listening to an actual play. I found one by the Technical Difficulties Gaming Podcast. They have an actual play of Runaway Hirelings. We'll throw a link in the show notes that really made sure to tell me how things flowed. Because what I was missing was how everything flowed together to make it work, like where the intro goes and how the turn flow is. Once I got that, and it all slipped into place and made sense. 
it, it and actually started playing it actually played very smoothly like there there really weren't any issues or bumps and the only things we had to look up were the actual moves not what order there weren't other parts of the rule book I had to go to because like the basic flow is you enter a room you get a couple player prompts you then use those to create some challenges and then have the players face those challenges and that's pretty much it right and then the neat part was having two different players provide prompts and then the Don Arc just taking those and going with it and just kind of letting your imagination go was pretty awesome. Like my favorite part was uh, naming the rooms was uh, the room was the tomb of exhaustion, which was this white marble tomb where in the niches, instead of having caskets or, or undead or, or skeletons or anything, had very comfortable beds and there were pillows and duvets and down pillows and all kinds of soft things to lay and rest on. And after the party took a nap, they pissed off a down golem, which to, to this day is probably going to be one of my favorite encounters uh, in a role play sometime. Now, one thing about the system of dungeon generation is that the dark really needs to be even more comfortable with improv than the players. Mm. Uh, and it does seem a little bit unbalanced that way, actually, uh, for some story games. But depending on the makeup of the table, that could be better or worse. Yeah. And the rulebook did suggest you source the players whenever you're stumped. So I'd be like, oh, what do you think could be in here? Like, we could have done more of that. So I think it's definitely more of the thing. The other thing we did not do that I totally, I don't know if we missed it in the rules, is you can spend a flail point. Again, they were short things to change facts. So someone could have said, well, that's not how I remember it. It wasn't a down golem. It was a whatever, something else, which I don't think we got into that. Yeah, no, there weren't or near enough flail points for people to do that. Yeah, for people to do that. Exactly, right? So now in the, in the game I ran, my players were a mix of traditional game fans and fans of more story-based indie-style games. And I got to say, it seemed like everyone had a great time playing. Everyone noted they were willing to play it again, but not right away. While it did seem like a fun game and a game you might break out, it's definitely a game you're just not going to play every week, a couple weeks in a row. This is a, a now and then game. We also all agreed that this would be a fantastic game to run or play at a game convention. Absolutely. I think because of the light, easy accessibility of it, as well as a con game, it could make a really great educational tool for improvisation uh, teams or drama class. And it would be inter it'll be interesting. I'd like to hear from Brian, patron of the show, Brian, if, if he's when he hears this, uh, if it might be something he would use in his work with you. Uh, again, just to get people talking and communicating and interacting in this freeform way. Um, though it is also a light, easy way for groups to try out the storytelling game style without mm. needing to dive into a full Powered by the Apocalypse or Forged in the Dark system. As for me, I had a better time than I thought I would while playing it. Um, single session fantasy dungeon crawler RPG relies heavily on the entire group's ability to improvise and think on their feet. And same as what Sean basically said, because of that, I don't know if it'll be for everyone. That, that improv level, this is a zero prep game. And if you didn't grow up playing Dungeons and Dragons and dungeon crawlers and watching Lord of the Rings, if you didn't have all those tropes, thankfully I grew up playing all those games and seeing all those worlds. So it was fairly easy for me to come up with something like a down golem. But if you don't have that background, I could see stumbling a lot playing this. If you're a fan of these narrative style games where the players have a lot of input into the world around them and dig dungeon crawling tropes, you really should check out Runaway Hirelings. For a section by section review, uh, second by section look at Runaway Hirelings, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. Well, let's take a quick moment to check in with the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch. So does anyone have anything to share regarding Runaway Hirelings? Anyone's here? I know there's a good chance some of the players might have been in the lobby tonight, but it looks like they may not be tonight. <laughs> we did run that game for some of our patrons. Thank you, patrons. I probably should have put that in the review, actually, that it was run for patrons to encourage other people to become patrons and possibly play games with us. But normally, a couple of the players would have been in the chat room, but it seems like we do not have them tonight. So I thought we might get some here. I was amused by uh, Red Meeple Ryan said we should have a system of a down golem. That totally could have come up in that game, if anyone had thought of that pun. Uh, interestingly, and I'm not qualified to comment on this one way or the other uh but there is discussion on twitter today in fact uh about the appropriateness of the word golem uh and and if we should if we should perhaps be using the word construct because of the origins of the word golem i don't know yeah. 
I've I'm, seen that one before. Yes, uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not qualified to discuss that on any terms, but it is just something that has come up today. I yeah, I've seen that one come up before, and I've always heard that it was fine. Like, yeah, if you're I, gonna, that's. I, I would have to see if there are new arguments I hadn't seen before. Yeah, it was, it if was there are, discussion. I can slowly <laughs> try to change my uh, lexicon to remove I mean, it. Construct is is a. Yeah, I don't see anything wrong with construct, wrong. but it would take me a while to. It would not because say golem. I mean we've been using the term golem for a very <laughs> very long yes. time. Uh, All right, I don't see any other comments from the lobby, so let's continue the review of Palooza. Welcome to the game room. This episode, we take a look at Breakdancing Meeples, a filler game from Atlas Games. Before we start, we do need to let you know that Atlas Games provided us with a review copy of Breakdancing Meeples. Right, Breakdancing Meeples was designed by Ben Moy and features art by Six Above. It was published in 2020, just this year, by Atlas Games. Uh, this is a filler game. It can be played with two to four players, with a full game taking well under... 10 minutes though i will say it's not quite as short as the five minutes it says in the box because you have to do things like shuffle card for a good look at what you get in the tin for breakdancing meeples be sure to check out our unboxing video on youtube so the first thing to know here is the fact sean just said what you get in the tin this game comes in a small tin container and not a box i am not a fan of board games and tins Games and tins do not fit well on board game shelves. I personally would much prefer publishers never use tins ever again. Well, at the same time, it is, however, a very transportable, very great purse or pocket game. I don't know. A cardboard box would be just as transportable, in my opinion. I guess it can't get wet, but you don't want this game getting wet. This is not a weatherproof game on the inside of the tin. So whatever. I, I don't like tins. Some people don't like tins. That, that was uh, their game, their choice. Fair enough. Uh, inside the tin, you get six meeples and six cubes and four different player colors, a bunch of routine cards, and the rules, which are short, sweet, and easy to read. I was surprised to find that each of the meeples are not only color-coded, but they actually have like artwork on them that gave them a unique kind of breakdancing themed look based on which team they were. I thought that was cool. That was a nice touch. That, like Totally unnecessary, except just for theme. Gameplay here is dead simple. You start with two routine cards. Each of these shows two meeple on them in different positions either on their heads, standing up, or on their sides. Those are your three meeple positions. Laying down meeples are lazy. They don't count. Starter cards, um, these each require two. And at the bottom are spots for putting scoring cubes. And the, the starter cards will go one point for the first time you complete it, two points for the second time you complete it, one for the third. You start at one timer, and everyone rolls their meeple, like rolling dice. You take a handful of six meeple and drop them on the table. If their meeple land in the pattern shown on the routine card, you pick up the meeple, you put it on the card. When you fill a card, you have to say the name of the dance move you just did out loud and place a scoring cube on the track at the bottom of the card. Then you get to take those meeple back to roll them. Uh, again, no meeple that lay on their back, and trust me, they like to lay on their back, are lazy and useless and not dancing. And to note, there is an app available for this game that handles things like the timer for you, yeah. so no need for an hourglass or anything like that. Yeah, very true. Oh, you can use just a one-minute timer, but yeah, the app is actually really solid. Once time runs out, players add up their scores for their completed routines. Then you enter the remix phase, and this is the, the, the brilliant part of this game. This is what gets you ready for the next round. This is where it's more interesting, because you have a routine deck, and you're going to draw a number of cards equal to the number of players plus one. Then players draft new routines, and it's in order of score from lowest to highest, which is a nice catch-up mechanic that the person in last place first choice these new routines will be more complicated than the player's starting routines needing either three or four meeples but will also be worth significantly more points mixed in with the routines are also what they call rally cards which are kind of like upgrades they cost you one point to take them and you tuck them under one of your existing routines to improve it in some way these have all kinds of different ways to improve it like you can score four points by having at least one cube on three different routines or if the routine you put it under you've completed all the scoring things at the bottom then you get some bonus points and stuff like that so another nice way that if you're feeling lucky you can make a dash for the lead even if you're behind now after the remix phase you play another one minute round same rules once that ends scores are tallied up again and you remix again the thing here though that adds another level to this game is you are only allowed to have three routines so if you've chosen a routine in the last remix you can take a new one now but you're going to have to replace one of your existing routines and i found in our plays most people choose to get rid of their basic starter routines because these more complicated ones are worth more points 
You continue this for two more rounds, four in total, and at the end, the player with the most points wins. That's pretty much it. It's dead simple. Uh, the companion app for this game, I think, is a must-have to really use it because it is a timer, but it's also a score tracker, which is really useful. So you don't need your pen or paper, and it keeps track of it. It even shows you what order you draft the cards in. It does all the math and thinking for you. Plus, it lays down some beats and gives you a rhythm to play with. Now, it's not needed. You could use any one-minute timer, but by having the scoring as well, like, I saw no reason. Like, it even has a thing where you say you bought one of the, I forgot the name of the, the enhancement card, where it automatically subtracts the one point. Like, if it, as long as you have a mobile device, just grab the app. It adds some nice theming, and odds are good that you're going to have a phone available, so it's a better use than checking your email during a game. <laughs> Very true. Though this being a real-time game, I don't think you want to check your email while you got your one minute going. As for my overall thoughts on Breakdancing Meeples, there's not a lot to talk about here, right? But I got to say I was impressed because like, like this belongs on last episode. Last week we talked about games that were surprisingly good or surprisingly complex, and this was kind of both. Because, like, the, the, the big mechanic's just dead simple. And it's one of those, why didn't I think of that? Like, you, you roll your meeple. I've seen people do it in Carcassonne. They roll their meeple and stack them, right? Like, like who hadn't, how, how had this game not existed yet? And to be honest, we know a designer, Daniel, from Everyday Board Games Podcast, who had been working on a game that used this basic concept of rolling meeple to fill slots on cards. Yeah, I think in some ways what's most shocking is that we didn't get this game before 2020. No, true. Like I, I totally true. Now I knew that. I knew what to expect here. I knew I was going to roll meeple and I'm putting it on cards. And I'm going to get points for completing sets. Like you knew that. Like even by the name breakdancing meeple, you can Im imply that. But that's it's it's the remix phase. It's that grafted element of the game that really makes this game more than just rolling a bunch of meeple and, and getting some points. Getting to draft new routines is the hard choice. It's it's the one, especially once you get to the end of round three, right? Where you're like, oh, do I get rid of a basic routine or do I try to get, or do I upgrade one of my basics? It's easy to do so that I can get bonus points for completing them all. Like there's an actual choice there. Like there's some planning ahead and trying to decide what to do. And by the time you get to round three, you probably figured out how your meeple like to fall because how you drop them does seem to matter. And I can't get meeple to stand up for the life of me. So the first thing I do is I always get rid of my basic card that has a stand up meeple on it and trade it for meeple on their heads because I seem to be easily roll meeple on their heads. But I love the fact that there's the options and then there's the rally cards that give even more choices. So there's even one that lets you trade in two meeple of one type for another, but it's not worth any points. So if you get that, you're limited to only two routines, but then you can modify your meeple like other people can't. Like the, there's some real decisions to be made here. Yeah, no, it's really nice when the designers can put that extra effort in so that it's not just rinse and repeat, but a solid thought out system with real catch-up mechanics designed right into it. Uh, to me, that says that they had some solid playtesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, overall, I had more fun than I expected with Breakdancing Meeples. Like, it started off exactly what I expected and exactly what I wanted, but then it actually added in some depth with the card drafting. Now, while there is more depth here than I thought I would find, like, please don't make me oversell this. This is not a complex or deep game. This is, isn't a thinky filler, right? This is just a very solid very quick silly game with a unique and cool theme it's not gonna replace brass or food chain magnet but that doesn't <laughs> mean it might not be a valid game for your collection uh I, I it's really in many ways it's uh a new version a modern version of pass the pigs meets roll for it mm -hmm. yeah i get it if, if you're looking for a quick filler that's got some solid table presence, especially like if you're playing public, right? You are yelling out dance moves, you're rolling meeple, people are getting excited. It's got a one minute timer, like one minute short, right? Like you get get all that agitation in there. It's going to get people laughing and interacting. Check out Break Dancing Meeple. If you're not into light, silly games, this one's not going to win you over. For me, I dig it. What I am really looking forward to is that public play. When the when the pandemic's over and I break that out at like an easy mode event, I think that's going to be the right venue for this game with some adult beverages and players who are not into big heavy Euro games and just want to have some fun. I think this game's going to be a big hit. For a slightly more detailed look at Breakdancing Meeples, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. Welcome to the Game Room. Tonight, we're going to take a look at Talisman Batman Super Villains Edition, a Dark Knight-themed <laughs> version of the classic roll-and-move game 
from Games Workshop. Before we start, please be aware that the op provided us with a review copy of this Batman version of Talisman. All right, besides the super long name, <laughs> Talisman Batman Super Villains Edition was designed by Robert Harris and Patrick Marino. Features art by Ross Taylor. Uh, it was first published in 2019, just last year, by The Op, better known for many years as USAopoly. Talisman Batman plays two to six players, and here's the shocking part for every Talisman fan ever, is a game takes about 45 minutes to about two hours. To get a good look at what you get with a copy of this new rethemed version of Talisman, check out our Talisman Batman Super Villains Edition un <laughs> unboxing video on YouTube. We're going to see how many times we can say it today. So I had to shrink our note. font just to get it onto the screen today. So. <laughs> nice. <laughs> some things of note for what you get in this no, Batman version of Talisman. There are 12 characters. These are all well-known Batman villains and you get a really sweet looking miniature for each of them. There's even a mini for Batman himself as well. The board is notable because it is huge. It's got a really cool aesthetic. It looks like a bunch of photographs of various parts of a, a prison, Arkham Asylum, taped to a board, which just looks cool, right? Like it's the, you're putting down the breakout map in front of the other inmates, right? It, it, which is neat, but it's like four times bigger than the original Talisman board that I grew up with. Which, I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Some extra room to move around is, is nice, but it is a bit of a table hog. That being said, I think the component quality overall is pretty nice. I gotta say, yeah, but the board's big enough you have to stand up to read it. Like, if I had a normal dining room table, maybe it would work since I'd have a player with four players on all sides and they could read it for you. But at my table, it involves, like, getting up and walking around to read parts of the board. Now, thankfully, I know Talisman pretty well, so I got to know the board pretty quickly and we started to memorize it. But it's huge. Like, it's, it's ridiculously huge. And then added to that, in this game, when you play cards, instead of playing them on the board, you're meant to put them on the outside edge. And then for inner realms, you put them on the outside edge with a marker on them. So it actually spreads bigger than the board. Like, to be honest, I think it's actually an issue. Like, there are going to be people who can't play this game because it won't fit on their table. So, uh, ignoring the rest of that. So, now, one of the things to note is that this board has a bunch of dark artwork, and that's the thing. This game is dark. This is Dark Knight Batman. This is not Batman the Animated Series or the old Campy 60 show that I grew up with. No Biff Bam Pows here. This game is all about evil villains trying to escape a prison, features dark artwork and even darker themes. Themes like drug use, psychotherapy, make this a less than friendly family game. Family fr friendly friendly game? That came out weird. Family friendly game. Instead, the art's solid. It's well done and very thematic. It's just darker than I would have liked. Uh, I have to think that most people these days, uh, outside of the Lego Batman fans uh, and, and the older uh, animated Batman series or the animated Batman series, are more used to this. Uh, this is in, in line with most of the Arkham series of games and mm. other, uh, other Dark Knight material that has come out recently. But if you've got kids, you just have to remember that it is yeah. uh, on the, you know, it's on that darker side. See, with us, for even the artwork, we're like, maybe our kids would be fine. But once you get into the, you pop some pills, roll on the D6 table to see what happens, we're like, no, that's not something I, my kids need to play, at least at this point in their life. As for the rest of the components, everything else is good to great, either awesome or, or serviceable, right? The, the one thing that is great that I love, one of my favorite components in here are these six-sided dice. They're, they're like the dark gray with bright yellow pips, and instead of a one, they have the bat symbol. And I'm like, if I ever play in a superhero themed Powered by the Apocalypse game, I'm stealing 2d6 out of this game just to play that, or any other supers game that uses d6. I love these. So enough about the components. How about we move on to gameplay? All right, so to start a game, you're each going to get a character. There's a way to randomize them. You get this stat tracker. So unlike some of the previous editions of Talisman, you're not stacking up stuff. There's just a dial to track your two main stats of strength and cunning. Um, you get some starting coins, which are actually plastic, which is nice. And fate tokens. The fate tokens are uh, Harvey Dent's two-faced, two-sided coin, another nice thematic touch. Uh, you're going to put your mini on your starting spot. You place Batman on the guard post, and you're good to go. Talisman has been this for years and always will be. Roll a d6 and move that many spaces. When you get on that space, you're going to do the thing on that space. The board is separated into three floors. Movement between floors is restricted. Only happens through specific encounters or going to specific spaces. After you move, you encounter the space you land in. 
Most of them are just a matter of drawing random cards. They're called encounter cards. On the outer realm, most of it's draw one card. In the inner realm, most of it's draw two cards. There is one deck of cards for each of the floors, which is actually a huge difference from the Talisman I grew up with. It just had one big adventure deck for everything. So they have tried to sort of uh, increase the theming with that and, and, and also do some difficulty works with that, which has had mixed results. Yeah. The, we'll, we'll get to an issue yeah. with those encounter decks later. The, a big issue. Now, some spaces on the board have pre-printed stuff on them. The stuff you do besides drawing cards, there's no way I'm going to cover them all because there's tons. Uh, basically, you land there, you read the card, you do it. So an example is you could fight the security guard to move up to the second floor. Or you can go to the corrupt guard in the supply closet to buy stuff off them. You get lost in the dark room. Or you can go to the second floor and make a deal with Don Carmine Falcone for a security key. And the security keys in this are basically talismans. And, of course, there's a ton more. There's lots of spots on these boards that all do neat things. So the fans of Batman will really enjoy the thematic nature of it, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot there in the game to connect you to the Batman universe. Yep. Totally agree. Now, encounter cards. These are a huge mix of things. There's objects, strangers, enemies, followers, and places. Each card is numbered. So if you have to draw more than one, you encounter them in order, which is kind of interesting. And what's really tough about that is enemies all have the same number, so they gang up on you, which, again, seems pretty thematic. Objects are picked up and carried. Uh, they can improve your basic abilities. You can only carry so many of them until you get, um, there's, I forget what it's called. There's like a pouch that lets you carry more. Followers will also join up with your villain and give you some kind of bonus. Strangers and places are things you can encounter multiple times. They tend to stay on the board. So if you hit a place, you read the card, you do what's on the card, then you put the card on the board. And then the next person that lands there can do it. Strangers are the same thing. Uh, Enemies, of course, have to be fought or avoided. There are a few different abilities that characters have to avoid things, or you fight them. So uh, when, you, when you really kind of extract the, the theme and things from it, it is in many ways your bog standard roll and move game. Yeah, no, it is. And fighting is dead simple. It's the same in every version of Talisman I've ever played, including this one. Roll a d6 for each side, add your applicable stat and any bonuses, whoever gets higher wins. Nice and simple. Defeated enemies, you get to keep and can trade in as XP to level up, which is a little bit different than the original rules for the amount, but the, the basic mechanics the same. Players, if they get beat, lose health. If you run out of health, you die. Interestingly, though, you're not eliminated. There is no player elimination in this game, which is another big change from the original Talisman, because the original, the goal was to be the last one standing. When you die in this one, you just create a new character, and you actually get to keep most of what was collected, which is uh, you get a big boost. Like, you don't lose too much. You don't start from scratch by dying. That's uh, certainly a, a nice bonus over a lot of games and massively over the original Talisman. Mm -hmm. Now, moving. This is, a, this is something new to this for Batman, though I hear it's in one of the older expansions called the Reaper for Talisman. If you roll a one, which is the bat symbol, as I mentioned on the dice, in addition to moving, you move Batman. If you're able to move Batman onto a spot with a villain, Batman tries to beat up the villain. Batman's stats are determined by what floor he's on. So if you fight Batman on floor one, he's pretty weak, but on floor two, he's pretty tough. And in floor three, he's a flipping 12, which is the max your stats can go to. Similarly, if a villain lands on another villain square, you can choose to attack your opponents. But in this one, you don't have to do life damage. You can actually steal objects, which is uh, an interesting. Again, that goes back to the original talisman. You keep playing like this. Roll, move, encounter the spot. Roll, move, encounter the spot until someone gets up to the third floor, turns in a security key, and beats the crap out of Batman in the final room. So have your talisman and beat the demon lord and escape the... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's pretty much the same, right? Except the, the, the original ending was completely different. So before I get to my thoughts on the Batman version, I do need to note that I have been a huge fan of talisman for pretty much as long as I can remember. I, I it, it was probably, besides a white dwarf, it was like the first hobby purchase I bought from Leisure World at Devonshire Mall here in Windsor. My parents gave me allowance for the first time, and I bought this game called Talisman, the Magical Quest game. I think it was in like 1982. It was early 80s. To this date, I have probably, it's going to be close compared to a couple games like Seven Wonders now, but I have probably played more games of Talisman than any other game over time. But none of those plays are recent because Talisman has become less and less fun. And now it's the original is a nostalgia trip. Like I break it out just because I'm like, oh, I grew up and I love this. And I want to show it off to people who never got to play it back in the day. Because the whole thing about Talisman, and this is true of this edition too, is that this is 
an experience game. This is not a strategy game. This is not a war game. This is not a miniature game. This is all about the story you tell and the experience. It has very little to do with player skill or system mastery. Like, yes, okay, you have some choices every turn, but it's mostly to do with the story you tell as you play. Embracing this is the key to enjoying any Talisman game. And, and in some ways, this is very little different than a game of Clue. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's a simple roll and move, but there are components and aspects to the game which can exceed the simple mechanic of the roll and move to become that game. And so you're telling the story about Mr. Mustard with the pipe in the kitchen uh, and not just rolling and moving to see what shows up on your checkbox. And, and Talisman is, is very little different than that. Uh, it's just a little bit more involved of a story mm -hmm. than, than Clue. Now, the other problem with the original Talisman, the Talisman I grew up with, has to do with game length. Uh, the joke I like to tell is that the first hour of Talisman's awesome, and the last hour of Talisman's awesome is your race for the Crown of Command, but the six hours in the middle kind of stink. And that's true. The original game could go on way longer than it was actually fun to play. And it was a number of mechanics. Like These include the winner being the last person standing. Whenever you have a game where the winner's the last person standing, it's one of those once someone starts winning, everyone teams up on that person and beats them down. This is the same problem that makes Munchkin not a great game because it can go on forever. The other issues, the, the original game had an issue with the roll and move mechanic where you needed to move the exact number to land on the right square to be able to get to the next floor. And that would happen where you just could not roll that two and for turn after turn after turn. And then there were some spells and encounter cards that basically reset you back to zero. So stay in for four hours and pulled your character up and you got 12 strength and 12 crap and 82 items and then suddenly someone cast the toad spell on you you drop all your stuff you go back to level one and then someone beats you up as the toad and you lose everything and and start from scratch that's a terrible mechanic well i am pleased to report that every single one of these issues has been fixed in this batman themed version of talisman i think it will be a real surprise to anyone to hear us rant a little bit about uh, anything that takes players out of games whether it be uh, you know, resetting you back to zero and throwing you back to the beginning of the game mm -hmm. or miss a turn. Uh, they're not mechanics we enjoy here at all. Yeah, they did keep miss a turn. I, I They did not fix that one. Miss a turn is still a thing in Talisman, unfortunately. I, they, they probably could have come up with something better. And you can still be turned into a toad, but you don't lose any of your stats or anything. I forget what it is. You become corrupted instead. So here's what they've done to fix it. So to improve game length. A couple things they've done. One is you don't need the exact roll to land on the important spot. So most of the time it's roll and move, but like to fight the guard to go to the floor too, as long as you have enough to reach the guard, you can do it. So that's awesome. Same thing with the, uh, oh, I always have the portal of power. I forget what it's called in Batman. This is the problem I have with playing Talisman Batman. Whatever the room is to get to the third floor. Again, you don't need an exact roll. If it's two away and you roll a four, you get there, which is awesome. Um, to level up now, it used to always be seven experience. Now it's down to five. That's surprising how much quicker you level up because of that you also get to raise one of your core statistics by one at the start of the game so it's basically like starting at level two in talisman they rebalance the feet deck which is the equivalent of the spell deck which removes some of the more powerful spells like finger of death was one of them and the one that turns you into a toad for example and they completely rebuilt the third floor one of the problems in the original Talisman is you would get to the third floor and you would decide if you want to go left or right, if you wanted to basically complete the game using strength or craft. And one of the ways you just kept rolling dice against death until you either died or death died. Another way you rolled like 3d6 and subtracted your stat and teleported somewhere back on the board. Again, resetting so you have to get all the way back to the middle. All that's gone. The third floor is just another floor. You go in a little spiral and you draw encounter cards. Along with these improvements, I'm certain there's some other tweaks, like that some of the object powers and the characters and the, the they just seem to be tweaked in minor ways. I mean, it's it's hard not to slowly improve a game after 30 years, even if you are just retheming it. Uh, problems become obvious yeah. over time. Now, besides these improvements, a huge amount of this game though is just talisman. It, it's it's Batman's talisman. It's the same board, same cards with different names. 
like while playing and i just did it earlier i called the the, the portal from the second to the third floor the portal of power because that's what's called in the original i kept doing this i'd be like oh that's the desert oh that's the craigs so, yeah if you roll a six you're gonna get a strength there even though it was called like the dark room or something so anyone who's familiar with talisman at all is gonna recognize the majority of what's in this box for what it is it's a retheme it really is now this isn't necessarily a bad thing it's just what it is and to be honest it's exactly what i expected when this game showed up Though you should be aware that playing it with someone like Mo could become horribly frustrating if you aren't a Talisman fan and would like to just experience the game in the Batman theme. Yeah, true enough. <laughs> I, if you're playing with me, I'm probably going to pull you out of the Batman universe a couple of times. So, like with all of this, because it's a retheme, you get all the good stuff about Talisman, all the fun adventure, the fun stories, the silly things that happen. Um, like we had the the closet that was filled with smoke where you just found random money all the time for the one game because we happened to get a couple cards in a row together that had it that every time you went to the locker room, oh, there was a rocker room there. There was a, a horde of enemies just like hoarded to the locker room. You know, you get those stories, but you also get all the bad things. Um, as I said, Talisman, this one too, is an experience. It's It's a game, but it's not a gamer's game. It's not a strategy game. It's a roll and move. Sometimes the dice don't cooperate. It's highly random, both due to the dice, plus there's the vagaries of the encounter deck. You'd never know which cards you're going to get. And I find almost every game, someone gets left behind due to bad draws, where someone else just gets like an early advantage and can kind of way earlier than expected start heading to the middle. But again, this is an experience. You're, you, you play Talisman to see who will win, not necessarily to win. Right. You want to you enjoy this, you know, in this case, this fantastic theme of the Batman world and the Arkham Asylum world and, and the villains and, and tell a story about your interplay on the way to somebody beating up the bat. Yep. And getting out. Like that's the whole thing. You need your key card, you get out Arkham and Batman's at the front door. That's, that's basically your theme here. Now, unfortunately there is one major problem that is not a talisman problem here with this particular printing talisman, Batman, super zones edition. And that is the encounter deck specifically the Thor three encounter deck the last power part i have no idea what happened here but this deck makes no sense by the time you get to the final floor of the game you expect to face the hardest challenges everything ramps up from floor one to floor two everything ramps up you expect the third floor to ramp up instead it has you facing some of the weakest enemies in the game enemies with the strength and craft sorry strength and cunning of two you also encounter a stranger that will greatly reward one specific alignment Whereas there's three alignments in the game. The opposite alignment is rewarded on floor one. Like it just doesn't make sense when half the characters are each alignment. Why is that in the middle? And then there's the, the ENT, the ENT card, which gives you a reward for bringing it to a spot on the second floor, but you get that card on the third. And once you're there, you really don't want to turn around. Like it doesn't, it makes no sense. All I can think of is there was a printing error. Something happened when splitting up the encounter decks for the Satoshi of Talisman, something with the, the I don't know, I, I have no idea. What I strongly suggest you do before playing this game, even the first time, like if you're described, don't bother trying to experience it out of the box. Shuffle the second and third floor decks together and use both of those for the second and third floor. All right. Well, that's uh, it's a, it's a seems like a, a pretty huge gaff. I'll, we'll have to definitely take a look and see if there's a uh, some strangeness that uh, was re reported elsewhere. Yeah, let's, I've seen other people complaining about it, but I didn't see a fix anywhere. So now throwing that out, let's ignore the encounter deck problem. There is a ton to like in Talisman Batman Supervillains Edition. As long as you realize, as we said multiple times, and I, it, this needs to be driven home, you are in for an experience, not a test of skill. I was amazed at being able to get in a full Talisman experience with four players in under two hours. Like to me, that blows me away. The Batman theme is very well done. Not really kid-friendly, but it wasn't meant to be. Just something to realize, and the components are great. Miniatures are brilliant, and I got to say, like, if you are a Batman fan and you like miniatures, you might want to pick this up just for the set of miniatures. Like, there's 13 miniatures in this box. It might be worth it just for the price of admission just to get those miniatures. If you're a fan of Talisman and Batman, buy it. Like, there's no reason not to if you like both these things. Now, if you're just a Talisman fan, it's up to you. Like if a Batman theme seems retheme seems cool to you, pick it up because that's all it really is is a retheme. Where I think the big opportunity for this game is though is for Batman fans who may not be used to playing hobby board games. Like I think this could be a great gateway game to designer games, like a great gateway. 
for people who never liked Talisman, this is probably not going to win anyone over. Unless maybe you only played it way back when I did and are used to games being eight hours long. So maybe give it one shot to see if it being in under two hours sells you on it. But it's not probably not going to trade anyone over. So interestingly, uh, one of the designers or developers uh, has said, during testing, we tried putting all of the hardest challenges in level three. It makes for a much longer game experience because the failure rate was high. To keep the game length shorter than the original Talisman, we opted to make the inner region more manageable so that players would have a fighting chance against Batman. I still think that that might be, I, I don't know, that sounds so, like an excuse. So they're just that doesn't explain they're the ENT it. card. They're, yeah. they're trying. Yeah. Like, if there's, I could see having some twos and threes in there to give you one more chance to level up, maybe. But having that one card that rewards half the players randomly be in the middle when the other's in the outer realm doesn't make sense. And that ENT card, like you bring it to the hospital and you get money. You don't need money. If you're at the point where you're going to face Batman, you don't need another three coins. Like there's no reason you would get in the tower, get that card, and then declare you're leaving because that's what you have to do on the tower. And then you start moving backwards to go all the way back, to go there, to get three gold, to do what before going back up? Like, I I don't know. That seems like an excuse to me. It's just not logical which cards are there. Well, for a more in-depth look at Talisman Batman Super Villains Edition, head over to TabletopBellhop.com and click on Reviews. Well, let's take a moment to check in with the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch. Any Talisman fans in the house? How about Batman fans? Any thoughts? Anyone played this one? Uh, a number of people are saying that they actually threw out the levels completely and actually and shuffled, shuffled all three decks together. That, that was the original Talisman way. Okay. Yeah. yeah, what's going on with my mouse? Hopefully no one could hear someone making all kinds of creaky noises nah, and hanging know. out in the doorway. And... Nah. Uh, <laughs> but not. yeah, the EMT is, is definitely called out. Even but after, like, why? Even after it makes the no designer. Sense. Uh, so Patrick Marino was the one who, who jumped in and, and talked about it. And everyone, afterwards, uh, everyone's like, okay, but what about the EMT? Exactly. What is this garbage? <laughs> what, what's this garbage? That one, and like I said, I can't remember the other one. The one that rewards the chaotic alignment, but not the righteous alignment. Like, it's fine. If you want to reward chaotic and righteous, put them in the same zone. Like, make it fair. Because there's equal number of characters under each alignment. Like, why are you just rewarding the chaotic players on the third floor? So, like, now there's a strategy of try to get your alignment changed to chaotic before you go to the third floor. And the other thing is it's a place. And it's a place where you can, it's, is it the first person that lands on it? There's another card that's in the third floor. And I can't remember what it is, but you put counters on it and everyone that lands on it gets something. Right. Well, once you pass it, you can't go back. Like that's part of the third floor. So why would you have a spot that multiple people can land on? Like it's right. just, and, and the other thing is the third floor deck is tiny. Like it's, it's smaller than all the other ones. Like I honestly thought maybe I had them backwards. Right. That the one deck is supposed to be the middle and the two is the outer, but there's not enough cards to fill the outer board. And, and deranged. I have that there. deranged, deranged is the toted. That's what the, the toted. Toted, is, toted is deranged. Okay, I couldn't remember. Um, See, I, again, I keep using the real term. So, yes, if you want to play this game with me, I'm going to bring you out of the Batman. <laughs> uh, interestingly, the, what there is in the, uh, in the files on BoardGameGeek are a number of um, homebrew card editions and other things. Oh, yeah, probably uh, stuff rethemed from the other to to, to, fix, to sort of, you know, help out a little bit. <laughs> and, uh, you know, add some new uh, bass signal cards and some new uh, tokens and things. Oh, that's cool. So, like, the end of points out. So, two, two of us are playing, right? The first time we get to the third floor, we cycled through the deck so quickly. The Your Alignment is Chaotic card came up three times. And D was the one that was chaotic. I was the one that was righteous. So, she got three. And it's literally the most powerful card in the game because you can get a life, a strength, a cunning, a fate point, or a coin. It's You can have right. any of the good things free like just for landing and then yeah may's played with us so we do have someone in the chat who actually has played with us which if other two of us if all four of us were in the third floor we would have just cycled through that deck every round right it just it makes no sense and i, I think there are excuses i don't know i think that's the there's lots of bad flag you got to say something like so yeah I, to me i think i mean i get the the putting two and two and three together but 
it seems like putting all three together and just doing a shuffle. No, uh, because there is be... a ramp between one and two. There definitely was. There was definitely definitely a ramp up between the two. Right. And there's items that you get in one that let you get to two, which wouldn't right. make sense to be in the two deck. Like, those decks make sense. Like, you right. get the, again, I know Talisman. You get the axe in Thor <laughs> 1, which means if you go to a forest, you can build a raft to go to the inner realm. Well, whatever the hell, it, I think it's like the, the key card or something. So you get the key card in Realm 1, which lets you port over in any office, I think is the equivalent. Like I said, I'm terrible for it because I played so many games of Talisman. Like, literally, I'm playing, and Deanna's like, it says roll this. I'm like, yeah, if you roll a 1, you're lost. If you roll a 2, you get attacked with a thing, strength 4. If you roll a 4 to 5, nothing happens. You roll a 6, you get a strength. She's like, how did you know that? And I'm like, because that's the Craigs. It's like, well, no, it's the Dark Room. And I'm like, yeah, but it's the Craigs. Right. Lock picks, yes. Sorry, it's lock picks. You get a set of lock picks. The lock picks are the axe. They give you plus one craft. And if you're in any office or dark room, you can use the lock picks to go across the other thing. Right. And yeah, yeah, like May, May says, it. it's still a fun game. It's oh, just yeah. got some problems, and that one it's hack that one. needs to it's be made. One you, need, deck. you need to you need to hack the decks. Yeah, uh, but which is why I said there. like the first time you play. Like I, normally, I always say play by the rules as written at least once. Don't. This is one exception. This is the exception that proves the rule. Just either shuffle the decks together or at least shuffle the twos and threes together and play. What I am tempted to do is make my own three, but then I'd have to sleep my cards. But I am tempted to, to build my own three deck. Right. That, that it's like, and I, I don't know. I could see not putting all the toughest stuff. Like, you don't want to put Batwoman and Robin both in there because they're both like an eight and a 12. Like, right. they're really tough. And especially if you drew both at once, like, that's tougher than the main boss. Right. So the original Talisman, I talked about this more on the, in the review. The original Talisman was a you you um last man standing and the end fight was not a fight when you got to the end you got this item called the crown of command and what it let you do was then teleport to any other player's space and it gave you an automatic 12 strength or craft and almost every time i played talisman because everyone knew that was the goal is they leveled up higher than that so when you got to the crown of command it would actually make you weaker because your strength would already be higher. Right. So we used to house rule it that you still got to keep it. Like you didn't you didn't have to go down to 12. Because the wording was like set your strength to 12. Which would be if you had a 14 it sets it to 12. Ha <laughs> ha you grab the crown first. Which made no sense. The game got way better when they put out the, the I think it was called the adventure. Where there were six different possible endings. And we used to take the crown of command out. Because it was that's the one that would make the game too long. Because if the other players just leveled up enough, and then there were so many healing cards that, like, the guy with the crown of command would come over and beat you up, but then you just move to the infirmary or the chapel, and you'd spend a gold and get all your health back. Like, it was just that's why the game went on forever. And by removing that, it doesn't matter how well the other players are doing. You just got to beat Batman, and I love that. That's that's what really does make it quick. And Batman has a twelve, and you can pretty easily figure out your odds of winning if the, he's going to roll twelve plus a d six, and you're going to roll your stats plus a d six. Right. Again, never played Talisman, but I'm torn on this. Love Batman, but hearing such issues could make it a no-go. Yeah, I, I, Talisman's a thing. Like, like if you like Tales of the Arabian Nights or Above and Below, and the, like, there's no read from a book, but it just it's the story. It's the maze in the chat now. Maybe she can remember what happened. There was the steam room, and we had like four cards in the steam room, and we were joking about it all the time. And I remember we did have the one, the one um, locker that just kept having money in it. So we made the joke at one point, Batman stopped by. So we were like, he's Bruce Wayne. And he put more money in it because he was trying to set a trap. Like that was a, an emergent story that we told while playing Talisman Batman. It's fun. It's, it's way better than the original, like to be honest. What I am didn't, again, didn't talk about here that I did talk about in the, the, the um, blog version is what I don't know is how many of these revisions are in Talisman 4th Edition Revised, which is the current printing of Talisman. Right. I have a feeling it might be an even more direct port than I'm used to. Right. Because I know the inner realm changing from choose craft or strength and split left and right actually changed in the third. So third edition got rid of the original inner realm. And I don't know when the crown of command was replaced by a boss fight. I do know the Batman moving around is an expansion for Talisman fourth edition called the Reaper. Well, and there's the Reaper like a moves lot around I mean, the board. Talisman fourth came oh, out yeah. in, in 2007 and they just keep yeah. putting out a new expansion every year. No, it's crazy. So here's some of the stories. So there was a hostage that we kept leaving behind in a closet. Yes, there was a hostage. So one of the cards was the hostage. You moved on the hostage. He goes in your spot, but then you could move anywhere on the board. But you had to leave the hostage behind. And we kept using it to teleport to where this closet was because this closet had tons of money in it. 
So whenever you we get we I got locked in the closet because I missed I missed a turn, and then later we found a policeman in the same closet. There was lots of coming out of the closet jokes because that's kind of thing that has happened. It was the locker room. That's the one I was trying to think of. Locker room was filled with smoke and Robin, I think. So we were like, Robin, Robin's in the steamy locker room. I'm just looking at a picture of fourth edition using the cataclysm board. And I mean, this thing is, well, if you turned it 90 degrees, it wouldn't fit on your table. Yeah, that's um, what I said. It's, They're nuts. I mean, it's because they've got the cards laid out all around it. And it's, yeah, it's just that the cards are supposed huge. to be outside. It's like six yeah. foot by four foot. <laughs> yeah. and, it's insane. Now, I got to admit, that's the other hack we did. We just put the damn cards on the board. Part of the fact of the board being so big, there's lots of room. Right. So the, the third and fourth time or fifth, I don't even know we played. We just put the cards on the board. Right. But it's fine. I think you'd enjoy it. It's just it's that kind of game where you, it's definitely a beer and pretzel. It's a chat with your friends. It's a, You only have to kind of half pay attention to what you're doing. Right. So you're playing a game while hanging out and laughing about silly stuff. Characters are all cool. The abilities are kind of neat. There's still some overpowered ones, in my opinion. Anyone who could get a feat anytime they spend it is just overpowered in that game. Because then you can just be like, feet, 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 feet. Yeah, I can't quite tell if, if they've, if it's left, right, or if it's uh, if it's straight around on that fourth. No, it, that it's game. definitely straight around and fourth. Like, you definitely oh, okay. have to go in a, in a circle. There's more spots. That's part of why the board's bigger, is the third round became bigger. Right. Where before it was only six. It was, uh, yeah, six in the original. I've got a picture I shared it on Twitter where I've got my original board sitting on this board, and this is literally like four times larger. It's right. crazy. But I don't know. I think I, I don't know. I've yet to play six player. I think it'd be kind of fun, but then they're gonna have the problem they had where someone's gonna get left behind. Yeah. As long as you're okay with that story, but there, it definitely hit a point where May kind of checked out because it's like well, I can't win. Like there's no well, yeah. way. I, I mean, can... it's, it's like that game we you and I had of Corridor the other day. It's yeah. like I really need to just well, end this because yeah, can't there's no resign. point in continuing. Yeah. Um, it was better with four than three, or than two especially. I think it'd be good with six. I just don't know how long it'd play, but it's still it's not going to be six or eight hours like the original. Right. I am good whenever you are. Alrighty, moving on. Actually, um, hold on. Well, Welcome to the Game Room. This episode, we're taking a look at Roll for Lasers, a museum security roll and write game. Before, we need to point out that Brian Shoemaker provided us a laminated review copy of Roll for Lasers. Uh, Roll for Lasers was designed by Kevin Dunkelberg and Brian Shoemaker. Features art from Eric Steed. Uh, funded on Kickstarter literally earlier today and is being published by Glass Shoe Games. Roll for Lasers plays two to four players, with each game taking half an hour to an hour, possibly longer, very much dependent on player AP or analysis paralysis. Now, there are three versions of this game that will be available. There is a dry erase board version, a laminated version, and a print and play version. Now, the copy that I got to preview was a laminated version. So this one is a bit too simple for us to have bothered with an unboxing video. All that you get with a copy of Roll for Lasers is one sheet board, a 66, a dry erase marker, a set of dice, and one page instruction sheet. Yeah, so this is dead simple. Like This is a bare bones game. But I do want to comment on something rather confusing about the board. So the board is a 12 by 12 grid separated into four regions, each of which is color coded for no reason that I can figure out. Added to that, it has an assortment of museum displays depicted in some of the squares on the grid, but these are so faded out you can barely see them, which I guess makes sense because they serve no purpose at all. And it's interesting because the, the art for the game, uh, as you can actually see right up above us there, um, you can see all these exhibits quite clearly. Uh, they're, they're very definitely there. But as that would impact the gameplay and the, your ability yeah. to play the game, they are faded to almost nothingness. Uh, and it's interesting because despite the fact that they are faded away to almost nothingness, um, the Kickstarter really goes on. And, and you know, there's been interest and, 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 and challenges in creating these museum displays. Yeah. So enough about this somewhat confusing artistic choice, and we'll move on to how to play. So at the start of the game, each player picks a corner to start in. If you're playing two-player, they have to be opposite. 
Each round starts with players rolling 66, and then you're going to pair up the dice. Each pair indicates a coordinate on the grid, right? Your X, Y, starting outward from your corner. So from your corner up, one, two, three, four, five, six, and from your corner left or right, depending on which corner you're in, one, two, three, four, five, six. At each coordinate pair, you're going to draw a target, which is a little circle, and you're going to place up to three. So, I mean, nothing, sim nothing sim uh, difficult at all. The basics are you, you roll coordinates and draw something on the board. Yep. Now, after all players have placed up to three targets, you roll 66 again. This time you're placing mirrors. These are a slash in a square, right? Running diagonal. Lasers, which are going to be fired in the next round, are going to reflect off these at 90 degree angles, orthogonally, just how you expect a laser to go. Mirrors are placed the same as targets. You're going to use dice pairs to place coordinates. You're going to place up to three for each player. Now, can you angle these mirrors in any format you want? Well, yeah, you can go either way. Like, yeah. there's the two options. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> cross this way or cross that way. But it, so it is It is a choice you're allowed yeah. to, to make. So you're, you're told where, but you can pick which angle. Yes. Okay. Well, you're also picking where, right? Because you've got yeah. six dice to pick from. You're pairing up your dice. Now, finally, you go back to the start player. You're going to roll 66 again, but this time you're firing lasers. You can fire up to three lasers. The difference here, though, is it can be from any row or column counted off from your corner all the way up to spot 12. And any number of dice can be combined. So if you had a 1, 3, and 6, you could combine those to fire from the 10 spot on either your X or Y axis. Now, lasers aren't drawn, because if you did, it'd be a terrible mess. You just trace the path with your finger. With the laser turning 90 degrees at every mirror hit, one point scored for every target that's passed through, and you get multiple points if you can pass through the same target more than once. You're going to fire up the three lasers. What's important to note here that you may not have caught, and I didn't even get when I was first reading how to play this game, is that no one owns anything on the board. All these targets and mirrors that have been drawn affects all the players, and you get points for hitting any targets, not just your own. So this is why we, we mentioned AP earlier on, because everything that's on the board is in play for yeah. everybody for the rest of the game. Correct. And so <laughs> the the... After your, your your first round might not be too bad, but things escalate as the game continues. Yes, because that first scoring round, you're going to turn the board 90 degrees. And everything starts over from the top with you now controlling in a different corner, which, depending on your player count, probably already has stuff in it. Uh, players are going to add three more targets. You're going to add three more mirrors. You're going to fire your lasers again. You're going to do this for a total of three rounds with four players or four rounds with less than four players. At the end of the game, the player with the most points combined over all the rounds wins the game. So, I mean, again, nothing difficult. The game itself is a very basic concept. But because of the interaction between all these aspects uh, put down on the board in every round, the complexity really ramps up high. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not your. This is not as, as simple, quote unquote, as you know, black box, mm -hmm. which no. <laughs> which isn't a simple game in yeah, the first that's... place. Uh, and this takes this up a whole other level on beyond that. Now, added to those basic rules, there are a couple special rules. One is every round, players can reroll any number of dice once. Now, this is over a whole round, so if you reroll when you're placing targets, you can't reroll when firing lasers. And then there are 12 special powers included in the game, and each game you're going to select three of them to use. Or you can determine randomly, pick them, whatever. Each of these can only be used once per game. They do all kinds of things. Like, there's a splitter that looks like a diamond, and it sends lasers off both directions, both 90 degrees. There's an orthogonal... Um, Sorry, fires off both orthogonal directions. There's a mirror that will reflect the laser straight back. There's get additional re-rolls. There's a large mirror that can go over three squares and so on. Like I said, there's 12 of these. And that's it. That's the game. It's draw targets, draw mirrors, fire lasers, draw targets, draw mirrors, fire lasers, add up your points at the end. So, I, again, you know, nothing much to it. But I think one of the really confusing things is the marketing about this game. Uh, if you actually read the the marketing uh spiel they talk about all the exhibits and protecting exhibits and your goal is to is to protect these exhibits within the museum from thieves by having the best security system and none of that exists in the game no it's it, it's the game is good I, I think the game is really interesting uh but but none of it has to do with any of the marketing material surrounding the game and, yeah. and and that's confusing and possibly concerning 
<laughs> yeah, it's 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 definitely an odd choice. Like as for the game, like the game si- gameplay is simple and like easy to teach and play. We just did it. We taught you all the rules. You know how to play. The only thing you might not know is what all the different special abilities are. But the basic gameplay, you got it. We just did it. The thing is, it's deceptively simple, right? Like it sounds like Sean keeps stressing it, and that's just it. Like the first round, it's not bad, but it just ramps up. Like once you get to the second and later rounds where you're drawing in quadrants that other people have already added stuff to and trying to plan ahead and putting targets and trying to block. Oh, it's so much to think about. Especially because, again, you're, you're never going to know where you're firing your laser from. You have a good idea. Yeah. You, you, and you've got a lot of flexibility. So you can mm-hmm. work, guess at where you'll be firing. But you're not going to know for sure. So you're planning to help yourself and hurt somebody else except – Three rounds from now, you also need to think about how that's going to and where yes. you're going to be firing from. And, and it really boggles the mind. Yeah. And then there's the probabilities, right? Like you're, you're, th- you're going to be able to shoot one through five almost guaranteed, right? One through six, because you're probably going to roll all those numbers. But to be honest, ones, if you don't roll a single one, like I don't actually yep. know the bell curve on 3D6. I think the average roll is a 10. So like, because the other thing is you're rolling six, you could technically combine four of those dice to get the spot you want and then just use single dice for there. Cause you can combine the dice in any combination. Like that just boggles the mind for what probabilities. And yeah, cause 10, I know 10, 11, I've had it. 10, 11 hmm? is 3d6. 10, 11 is 3d6. So probably 12, 13 or something is 4d6. I don't even know. Right. And that's way up the board. I, overall though, what this means is this game is, uh, we were talking about an earlier review, breakdancing meeple, how it's not a thinky filler. This is, oh, yeah. this is very much heavier and thinkier than you think, which I think is a good and a bad thing. Because on the positive side, this can become like chess like, like that that whole like in later rounds trying to predict where your opponents are placing and figuring out the optimal pass and your mirrors to be able to bounce around the right way and then toss the right special object in so that it's a mirror and it bounces everything back through the points again. Like and figuring out the path can like if you get one that's worth a lot of points, it's very rewarding. You get that I made a great move. I, I did this. This is awesome. On the bad side, this can be a ton of AP, longer playtime than you'd expect, and a ton of downtime. Now, the designer has called me out on this, supposedly, and that is that it's theoretically possible for multiple players to be drawing on the board at once. And yeah, I guess theoretically, but it's a single sheet of paper. Like, it's an eight and a half, eleven by sheet. And even with just two of us, we found we were getting in each other's way. Yeah. So if you're looking for like a 15 minute quick game, this is not that. This is not at all. Maybe check out Breakdancing Meeple if you want like a 10 minute quick game. This is a thinky filler that stretches the time limit. Like I'm I'm tempted to not even call it a filler at this point. So I think this game to me is a game that uh shouldn't necessarily be thought of a sit down uh, thought of as a sit down and play game. One of the ways that I think this would be a fantastic game to play is if you threw it up on the on the you know refrigerator and mm-hmm. one of you in the morning as you're sitting down having your coffee went through and worked out their turn and the next person when they had time on their lunch sat down and worked out their turn and then and everyone sits down after dinner and does a scoring round um and and just drew it out and and cuz it would the the again you've got that potential for AP and mm-hmm. you don't want to be either rushed or feeling like you're dragging everyone else down playing it where I, so i think taking this game out of the sit down game concept has some real potential for it yeah i can see that what, like what i would deanna and i were talking about was what i was thinking this would be really good for is because you don't need much right it's it's a sheet of paper especially if you have the print and play like you don't even need the laminate sheet you can just have a sheet of paper you can fold it up you throw it in your back pocket you throw it in your glove box and then when you're out for coffee you're out for a couple drinks you break this one out because all you need is a dry erase marker, or if you're playing the print and play, just a pencil. You need a pencil in 66 and the sheet, and you can play anywhere. Like that, that's where I think this game could shine. Although I don't now know I about do... with adult beverages. <laughs> eh, I well, you might it, it might make the game quicker or longer. It could go either way. <laughs> now I do have a few other minor complaints, and these made me think the game just could have used a bit more development and a bit more play testing. Like there are play testers credited and everything, so I think that the 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 designer at least played with their friends i don't know how many other people saw it just little things like the score sheets on the map and there is no way to track your individual laser fire 
So you have to remember, okay, on my first laser, I hit three. On my second laser, I hit seven. And on my last laser, I hit six. What's that total up to? Like, we ended up just using a scrap piece of paper. But, like, why there isn't, like, a divider on the score sheet that just shows put your three laser scores in your total? Just something like little like that. Um, I think there should have been something to randomize the special abilities because it says pick them randomly. But, like, just give me a chart. Like, there's 12 of them. Or make it so there's only 11 and make it 2d6. It would have been really simple. Of course, 2d6 favors the middle numbers of seven. So... I don't know, just that would have been nice. Uh, the special abilities themselves seem to greatly vary in how useful they are. Um, we had games where no one used any. Like, we picked three random ones, and no one used a single one of them. Um, I would have liked a grid of numbers on the map, just like one through six in each of the quadrants. I can count past six, but just something, to, it speeds up play. I don't have to count. One, two, three, four by five. That would have been kind of nice to see. Um, just little things. Um, rerolls. Rerolls seem really powerful but it seems like if you don't use it because there's a you should get something for that like deanna suggested like if i don't use my reroll i should get a point like there should be some reward for not using your rerolls it just i don't it just needed more balance it needed a just it just feels close like it feels like it's it's not quite at a level of completion that if i was producing this game i would have released it i i think i think this is a great start of a game yeah um what i would love to see um, is is a digital version of this emerge? Because uh, I could see this as being something that you and I, you know, have open on on a mm-hmm. window and, and and are taking turns, uh, you know, throughout the day, uh, or on BGA or something, uh, really easily. And that mm-hmm. takes away all of your problems about the scoring and and the mm-hmm. fiddling and the the, not the the piece of paper not being big enough for multiple player on. Uh, if if you move that into a digital, it becomes way easier. Mm-hmm. Plus, it takes away the problem of accidentally, you know, moving in the wrong direction when you bounce yeah. off something. You don't have to worry about that anymore. You know, computers are good at straight lines and lasers. <laughs> yep. No, totally different. Like overall, we had fun. I I dig it. This is a neat game. Roll for lasers is a neat game. Um, I, I, again, I think it's really neat how portable, how little is required to play is is a nice touch. The thing is, like, I can see playing at a coffee shop. I can see doing what you're talking about on the fridge. But I can't see that often going, hey, let's all sit down, four of us, in my game room and play Roll for Lasers. Like, it's just not the kind of game I can see breaking out on game night to play at home. Like, if I'm going to spend an hour to an hour and a half playing something that makes my brain burn, there are other more involved games I would probably break out. Yeah. Stuff that, like, a Feast for Odin with two players or getting into, in a previous review, we brought up Food Chain Magnet, right? Like, if I'm going to go thinky and I'm going to go brain burn, I might as well, and I'm home, I might as well, you know, pull out a game with lots of components and bits and gameplay. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one because it's probably one of the higher weighted, low, easy, you know, portable, yeah. light game. Like it, for, for a really light game. It's it it isn't rated yet on BG uh, no. on BGG, but it's got some real weight to it because of that uh, analysis paralysis issue and and the number of combinations and potential in there. But because it's just you know paper and dice, mm-hmm. paper and pencil and some dice, it doesn't feel as fulfilling as setting out a copy of Brass Lancashire mm. and playing for the night. Oh, exactly. And then, of course, is that my main complaint about this game is the one Sean brought up earlier is the missed opportunity. Like, there's this artwork. It's a museum. Like, there's why why give me pictures of exhibits? And each of the four quadrants is a different hall. Like, there's I, I know there's the Egyptian hall, and like like there's design work that went in there, and there's nothing. Like, it, it just feels like there should be something. Again, that's just feels like it's not quite developed enough. Like, just something really simple. Like, if your target is over an exhibit, you get two points instead of one. At least then there's a reason. It anything. just feels like it needs <laughs> anything. Yeah, something. Now, I do have to say, and th- this is probably the, the biggest selling point of this game, the print and play version is a dollar, a dollar for the PBF. And we definitely had way more than a dollar's worth of fun with this game. Like, I, I have played much worse games that I have paid more money for. Uh, like, with the print and play, you literally print off a sheet whenever you feel like playing or print off a few, fold them up, toss them in your purse, toss them in a glove box, break it out next time you're going to go for coffee, have a copy up on your fridge with a magnet, right? Like, just print off as many as you need. I, I don't see why not. Or the other thing you might even be able to do in this, wow, you want to talk about brain burn. you got four players, play four games at once. Then there's no downtime because everyone's playing their own board, and then you pass the sheet to the next person. That actually could be quite fun. That might be a good tournament game, actually, to be honest. But, like, for a buck, come on. 
Yeah. Uh, and, and unfortunately, the Kickstarter is done, so I don't know what the price will be when the final game comes out. The print play should still always be a buck, but like the laminated copy was two dollars plus shipping. It wasn't an expensive thing. Um, we're not going to get into the vagaries of the the, the Kickstarter itself because it's it was a little unique, I will say, for a Kickstarter, but it's done now. Yeah, and I have to say, you know, if you do enjoy the game, um, you know, it's besides the price uh, uh, or, you know, the mounted version, ETH, which I'm sure will be available uh, eventually, is is a really great and solid investment for this game that makes it, you know, easy to play and, and not as portable. But, you no. know, if it does turn into a game you play at home somehow, it it's great. I could see, you know, mounting it on the wall and, yeah. again... Rather than the fridge, you've got it mounted on the wall, and you walk there up, you and go. you can, uh, you know, you can draw your draw your turn in. Now, what I will admit, I would love to see, and I think they could make really good money on, is a someone take Ket the laser game and and make this because Ket is a physical game that someone I think think Fun produces it, which is a version of laser chess. Give me an actual laser. Give me actual mirrors. Give me targets that put that get put out there that if they get hit by a laser, they light up somehow. Give me that in physical version, and this could do fantastic. That, to me, is what should have been kickstarted. Like, to me, that's a kickstarter. I need to raise lots of money to do this, but it'll be awesome if it happened. Absolutely. I would love to see a physical version of this. Like, uh, this is physical, but, you know, a three-dimensional, <laughs> toy-erific. I, I would be all for a toy-erific version of Roll for Lasers, like Ket the Laser Game and other other versions. Now, I know that we're working on something for con season, and unfortunately this year we didn't have a con season. So I, I am hoping maybe next year this is something we'll see. But I think that was just going to be a con prop to sell laminated sheets of paper. <laughs> like, really? Well, for a deeper dive into Roll for Lasers, head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. So let's take a moment to check in with the lobby in our chat room here on Twitch. All right, we got thoughts on Roll for Lasers. I saw some stuff go by. We actually had some chat about this one. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, and, you know, super portable. Great for killing time sitting out somewhere. Absolutely. Yeah, somewhere else. Like, not in my game room with everyone focused on it. I, this is the worst game I have ever played for me grabbing my phone. And then then I'm missing out on stuff, right? Oh, yeah. Because Deanna's just like, I got eight points. I'm like, wait, how did you get eight points? Like, I'm just, <laughs> like, you kind of have to edit well, yeah, edit especially... each other. Especially because you know you're not you're not drawing in the the laser line exactly. You're just moving your finger, and that's where you know that computer would would super help yeah. because you do you know that oh if you fire a laser here whatever the computer tells me is right. I'm not yeah. I don't have to worry about that anymore. Now, I gotta admit like there's no laser physics here, right? It's all ninety degrees. It's all yeah. straight ninety degree turns. Like it's not hard. There's, there's no although weird... well when you get into some of the specials though and you you all of a sudden yeah, your lasers are branching off in yes. three directions. That is where you know. it gets hard. Things to be can honest, get a little that crazy. Is but yeah, like I, I have never spent so much time on a phone, my phone during a game. Like I was on Twitter, I was on Facebook. Like I, I was having a hard time with the downtime in this one. And like I said, they say you can both do it at once. But the other thing I was finding is some of your decisions are going to be based on what the other players place. Yep. And they're telling you go, go real time. But then if you want, you can make people go ahead of you. And I'm like, eh. though I don't know if it makes it more playable and I can get done in half an hour. Maybe I would go for it. Like, I think you need the big mounted board or something. Or, like, if you had a small, like, if you're at the second cup, those little round tables, yep. then maybe two people could use that sheet of paper at once. Yep. Maybe. <laughs> I, I don't know. There's, there's like, you're in your own quadrant, especially four players trying to do it. I yeah. get it in theory. I Like I said, the designer says that's how it was designed to play. I, lo I do love your idea of, like, put it on the fridge, right? Like, just stop yeah. by, fill it in. Of course, there's a lot of trust required there, but... <laughs> Uh, the, the dice coordinate system is actually kind of brilliant. Yeah, no, especially I, the fact the lasers can go past six. Yeah, there's then, some there's some great ideas in this game. It's 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 super solid, but there's also just some I don't understand like weird what you design did choices and yeah, yeah, smudging. Uh, deep, yeah, well, that brings too, up yeah. smudging. That's definitely if you're if you're leaning over and, and and reaching or you know moving around, especially once you're past that first round and you've already got a, a quadrant done. Yeah. Um. Sounds like a science class laser experience rather than a museum. I, Pennywise says that. Oh, and I totally absolutely. agree. Absolutely. Like there's the other thing too is it talks about how your goal is to cover as much of the thing in the end. Like that almost makes me wish you did draw the lasers and you lose one point for every empty square in your zone or something. Yeah. Like there's just something. And then uh, one of the things, um, Hungry Gamer 
suggested in their review was if you were able to surround an exhibit with lasers, yeah, that should be worth something. Like there's, but then like without drawing them, you'd have to like somehow track your three lasers to see what got. Like I can get why they didn't do some of this because oh, yeah. it would add even more to it, but I don't but, know. But yeah, like the con the concept again. Back to that PR their PR material. A handsome sum awaits the, for the team who can best demonstrate how they will safeguard us from greedy robbers. Yeah, yeah the, the, I don't the theme doesn't matter. I, I don't know. To be means. honest, it's an abstract. Pasted on themes on abstracts is a thing. It but doesn't bother me that it's the fact there's art that's not used. Like, why is there even art? Why well, isn't it's it just, just a that grip? they're like doubling down and, and leaning so heavily. If they just yeah. said, hey, this is a museum and you're Well, they hired lasers. someone to write the theme. Oh, yeah. There is someone yeah. literally credited to write the theme. They paid someone. Well, I don't know what they paid them, but they, they at least paid them an exposure <laughs> to write the theme for them. Yeah, no, they, I mean, they've gone into like the doubling down on this yeah. concept and the theme behind it and the, the, the different sections and what they mean mm -hmm. and what exhibits they are. Which So here's, here's a good comment from Deanna that I think sells it better than anything else. There's got to be something there because you're talking about it and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I want to play this again. <laughs> There we go. Sounds fun, but it needs more. If I want a filler grid game, I'll play Cartographers. I haven't played Cartographers. I've heard good things. Um, Deanna noting playing four games at once here. Your brain would melt on fire. And, and I don't yeah. know. I don't think it'd be any worse because it's not like you remember where things are. Yeah. Like you're passing it and it'd just be a new situation to react to. Yeah. And D, D sums up my comment, my thoughts really well. Pasted on theme doesn't bug me, but the theme as written in detail yeah. doesn't fit anything. Yeah, like admit it's, it's pasted on <laughs> instead of keep yeah, trying to just, push just it. Just say, hey, you've got a museum and you're designing a laser system for it. Done. Yeah. Period. <laughs> but yeah, and stretch goals to, to add new exhibits that do nothing. Yeah. I, <laughs> yep. <laughs> like even the color coded. It's not like I play green because next turn I rotate the board. Yep. Like why did they color code it? Code it? I like, I, I don't know. It's it's weird. But it's such a great concept. Like it, it just, is. I don't it know. Is. It just it's... needed. The, something to make it great it's neat it's good it, yep. it's worth playing but it's just uh two player it's particularly good too because you get rid of one row so you're playing a 10 by 10 grid right and sixes are wild which makes it so much easier to play stuff where you want right all right uh, i'm yep. good to move on whenever right. you are good to move on Welcome to the game room. Today we're taking a look at a beginner level escape room in a box. Exit the game, the haunted roller coaster from Cosmos. Before we start, please note that we received a review copy of this escape room in a box game from Cosmos. All right, Exit the Game, the haunted roller coaster, like all exit games, was designed by the pair of Inca and Marcus Brand. With this particular episode, getting some help from Ralph Querforth. Artwork was provided by Sylvia Kristoff, Martin Hoffman, and Michaela Klein. Or Kiln? Sorry, I apologize for that. This Escape Room in a Box was published by Thames and Cosmos in 2019. The Haunted Roller Coaster is billed as a gateway exit game, perfect for beginners. It plays one to four players, and you're expected to complete it in under two hours, depending on how well you play puzzles. For Deanna and I, this was our third exit game we played, starting with the Secret Lab, then moving on to the House of Riddles. Now, you can find reviews of both of these on the blog and in earlier podcast episodes, which we'll drop links to in the show notes. Since this particular exit game was specifically designed for beginners and is noted to be a great introduction to the series, we decided to take the chance to introduce our daughter to the series, who is currently 13. Together, we managed to solve this escape room in a box in under an hour. Which is uh, pretty much as sort of, and that's around the right average time for the uh, for the escape boxes, I think, so far. Well, that's the ridiculously you got max point score. Right. So I would think the average would probably be longer. So due to the fact that this is a puzzle game, and we didn't want to give away any unwanted clues, we did not record an unboxing of this game. No, we did not. Now, on the blog post, I think I am going to have to put some spoiler images because... If you're not worried about spoilers, you got to see some of this because the components in this particular exit game were excellent and did some things I've never seen in an exit or an escape room box before. Some things that were true surprises that none of us expected. And I kind of wish I could spoil it, but I don't want to. Well, I mean, can you can you do um, can you do spoiler reveals you know, like like 
uh, blacked out text on. Uh, oh yeah, no, I, I I can do it on the blog. We just can't yeah. do it here. <laughs> on the blog, there'll be spoiler pictures. I've got all the pictures. I've got the cool stuff. There'll be uh, you have to click through to see it. But right. yeah, I'll definitely be able to do it on the blog. It's just not something we can really do here on the podcast. Right. Though we could edit in some stuff at the end of this video of Sean's willing, <laughs> and then just tell people to turn off the video before we share the images. We might consider doing that. We'll see. We'll put up fair warning if we do decide to do that. Right. So this is the problem, right? This is the problem with reviewing these games. It's hard. We don't want to spoil anything for anyone. So I got to keep things as general as I can. So I will start off by saying I didn't expect much from this. Um, this goes on our, our, our surprising games. This one surprised me considerably because the last exit game we played was the House of Riddles, which is rated a 2 on their difficulty scale of 2 is 5. And I don't know why 1's not the easiest. I don't. I really don't know. I think they want people to think, well, 1's for beginners. I'm going to start at 2. I don't know. Whatever. This is the lowest difficulty of all the exit games. And House of Riddles was a disappointment, a really big disappointment, to be honest. It was completely linear. All the puzzles were so dead simple that we were solving them as fast as we could read them. You would flip a card and just be like, yeah, yeah, okay, you have to do this. Yeah, it's two, five, six, go. Like, we played through this in record time. I think it was under half an hour. And the only reason it took as long as it did is you needed scissors and to cut and fold things. And <laughs> doing that took time. There was really no challenge for Deanna and I in playing the House of Riddles. Well, and, and to be fair, I mean, you guys worked your way down from, from the higher level games. That's true. So yeah. not, not surprisingly. But then the surprise came with this one because the Haunted Roller Coaster is also rated a two. So here I expected more of the same. I thought we were just going to plow through this. And one of the reasons that I brought our daughter in is I kind of thought we'd get to these easy puzzles and Deanna and I would kind of sit back and let her figure it out to, to, to give her a bit of a challenge. And interestingly, this is not. like um, So this intro, the intro to the set, we use the app to read it to us, but it's also in the book actually explained how it's a beginner level game and it warned you right from the start that it would be linear and what linear in this case for an exit game means is there's no crossover between puzzles like you never need the part of part a to solve part y way later so everything's contained um there's always a book included with these and in this one you literally only look at one page at a time whereas in say the secret lab you are given a book and a map and you're kind of like eh, figure it out do something Whereas here it's, you know, go to page one and read page one and then flip it. Once you solve page one, go to page two, right? Uh, so it told us ahead of time, which was kind of cool. Um, here it's clear what tools are in your toolbox for each specific puzzle. Uh, there are 10 puzzles, which is, again, identical to House of Riddles. So you have the same, it's linear, you have 10 puzzles, everything's contained. That part's the same as House of Riddles. So I expected the disappointment to be the same, but that is where this comparison ends between them. Right. So despite the fact that these are the same difficulty and the same game manufacturer, yeah. They managed yeah. to they managed to catch everyone off guard. They did, because we were surprised. There there were a number of very unique and interesting puzzles in the haunted roller coaster. For one, compared to the other one, there was a coherent story here. And the theme was present in every puzzle. The last one was just random rooms. It was a mansion designed by uh, escape room aficionados and every puzzle was standalone and there was nothing tying them together. Here, everything was tied together. It was a haunted roller coaster. So there were all kinds of spooky twists and tricks. There were a number of cool things were done with the components of this box this time around, including some true surprises. There was actually a jump scare in this, which was fantastic. I, I wish I could say more. I, I really do, but I don't want to spoil anything for someone else that's going to go through this box. Well, I have to say, the concept of a, a box board game escape room actually managing to pull off a jump scare is pretty impressive. Yeah, it, it was. It really was. Now, I got to say, every exit game has impressed me in some way. Uh, some ways with a variety of puzzles, right? The out-of-the-box thinking required and the unique use of the components. Like I, every time I play one of these, I'm like, oh, look at this cool thing they did. But this one just did it better than all of the other ones, including Secret Lab. This was by far the most interesting exit room game we played. And it had some of the coolest artifacts, stuff that's left over at the end of the game that you can still, like even the reward was a cool surprise that lets you continue the fun after you finish solving the puzzle. Now, as for my daughter playing, she really enjoyed it. Uh, she was a great help. Like this was, like I said, we were probably going to sit back and let her do some of the work. No, we didn't have to do that. Uh, she managed to find the solutions for a couple of the puzzles, noting things that Deanna and I missed or thinking of a different way of thinking of things that we didn't realize. Like out of the 10 puzzles, 
there was one that was blatantly obvious. Like I flipped the card, immediately knew what to do, did it, and we were done. The other nine all took some work. And we never had to sit back and let Big G solve something just to keep her involved. Right. She was a full partner the entire game. Interesting. Now, I can't help but strongly recommend the Haunted Roller Coaster. Like, seriously, this is everything I want in an escape room in a box. The puzzles were cool. The physicality was excellent. I, I think this is the best gateway to the series. Like, this is now, if anyone says, oh, I'm thinking about picking up an exit game, start with a Haunted Coaster. Start with a Haunted Roller Coaster. It's, it's, it's almost perfect. Like, for fans of series of the game, if you don't own this one, pick it up. Like, despite being a too difficulty, there's just, it, this one's fun. There's neat stuff in this box. It does neat things, and I think you'll enjoy it. Even if you don't get stumped, you're still going to have fun playing through this. Interesting. And I do note the Haunted Roller Coaster is uh, a tw 2019 release, yeah. whereas a large number of their games are earlier, 2016, 17, and 18. Yeah. I wonder if they have learned a lot from their I earlier, so. the first three years. And so there are, it looks like uh, five five games from 2019 and 2020. And I wonder mm -hmm. if it might not be best... Um, you know, to start with those newer ones, and then if you want to jump back and and play yeah. some of the older ones to to have a little bit of fun and challenge, but uh, always start with the newer ones to get that best experience of them learning learning their own craft. Yeah, like I said, the other thing too is like the other the haunted mansion. I'm trying. I'm ahead the name wrong. I forget the other one we played. House of Riddles. House of Riddles. Thank you. Uh, the problem, like House of Riddles, nowhere did it say it's an introductory game. It just said it was a rank two, whereas this one was very clearly saying a great intro to the exit series. So I don't know, maybe they spent more work on this one, but there is definitely a quality difference between House of Riddles from 2016 and this one released three years later. Like a, a significant, not physical quality, but just the quality of the puzzles, the quality of the theming, how well things tied in together and so on. Right. The only thing I think I would have done different is haunted should have clued in more this was very much um a game we probably should have played closer to halloween it just would have fit in better like it like this would have been like i i should have thought of this like there's probably not gonna be any trick-or-treating this year this would have been great to break out this year on october 31st i think with the kids because right. i i think even our youngest daughter would have had fun seeing this game and taking part and some of the puzzles she might have even been able to help with I, I think it is a, a solid addition to the Exit series. And again, if anyone wants to get into the Exit series, I now think this is the gateway. Do skip House of Riddles. Don't even bother. Just pick up the Haunted Roller Coaster. Great introduction for the game to give you a great idea of what they can do in these small boxes. All right. Well, for a more in-depth look at Exit, the Haunted Roller Coaster, head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. I'd take a moment to check in with the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch. I just wanted to point out that the newest one is Exit the Game, The Cemetery of the Night. And that's huh. their 2020 release. Uh, it's showing as a wait three. I don't know what it's um, difficult. What it's their, their difficult. It be on the back of the box. Uh, oh, it's a, it looks like a three. A it's a three. Yeah. So, it's a, so that may, maybe, maybe something like that for Halloween for you guys might be, uh, maybe. Might be a good one. To be honest, I could probably get these off Cosmos as review copies, but I hadn't finished the last ones they sent. <laughs> we still have one left. It's the hardest one they ever published. Ah, uh, okay. It's back here somewhere. It's a two-parter. But yeah, the, fre the, the fresh newest one is Cemetery of the Night. That's this year's. Yeah. One, uh, one of the problems is we have to play it when my mom's not here because <laughs> it requires an open flame for one uh, of the puzzles. Yes, that is. So I don't know that we were going to save it for a night. She went out the cards, but again, <laughs> that's not something that's happening right now. No, but like I say this one was solid. Like, like I, both Deanna and I were just expecting to plow through it and like, Oh, this will be fun. Cause we'll be playing with, with, with big G. Yeah, like yeah. that's what will make it fun. And we oh, were just absolutely. like, no, there was some really, <laughs> really neat stuff in this box. Excellent. And like I said, what, I don't know if we can do it for the video, but I might send you the pictures of some of the stuff. Yeah. I'm sure we can work out something. And just throw it at the end, right? Yeah, like yeah you put, just put up a huge spoiler wall. A huge wall. spoiler. And just share, like, I've got five or six pictures, right? Like, just share yeah, the yeah. pictures. And what I'll, what you don't I'll even do have to explain them. Put, it, uh, put up a spoiler wall, figure out how long the content is, and then put in a, this is how long, you know, skip yeah. to this, or or skip to the end, or, or you know, See, whatever. I was really hoping that today we'd be able to actually put a skip to the... Mm. We were so close. 
I'm looking again. Did they start going up? <laughs> nope. Went down. It was 946 at the start of the show. We're down to 945. Right. I don't know. I don't know what happened. It's bugging me. Damn it. I was hoping all of a sudden I'd look to be 20 more. Yeah, Deanna wants to play. Oh, night is in K-N-I-G-H-T. When you yeah. said it, I was thinking N-I-G-H-T. No, no. So that was one concern that uh, Big G had was the horror aspect. But I'm like, it's it's haunted roller coaster. But she hates those in real life. We put her on <laughs> some, and she does not actually. I love those. So it's right. one of my favorite things at at um play playgrounds theme parks are haunted stuff, right? Like right. where the, the House of Mirrors or haunted coasters or whatever. The uh, Universal Studios um, Men in Black ride where you're shooting the aliens. I love those. Yeah, the introduction was a little overly creepy. Like it just described it badly. Right. Um. Plus, there was some blood on some of the artwork, which mm. she gets a little disturbed by. But she was fine once we started going. And, like, it's, it's Halloween spooky, right? Like, that's... Right. Yeah, yeah. Halloween spooky, and to me, is not a bad thing as long as you know what you're going on. It just... It was it was much more Halloween-themed than I expected. Right. With Haunted Coaster, I thought it was going to be more theme park scary any time of the year, where th- there were some definite Halloween theming going on. Yeah, that makes sense. But, man, some of the puzzles in that were just so so well done. <laughs> And so neat. Cool. All right. Moving on. Yeah, I'm good. Alrighty. Hang on. And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last year. What games hit our tables? Uh, every week we like to take a look back at the games we played and the events we attended and any other cool gaming stuff that's been going on. Now, most of what we got to the table this past week here at the Bellhops Home were games we've already talked about tonight during the reviews, right? We played some Roll for Lasers, um, a game where we actually used special items, because my review was going to say the special items, no one ever uses them. But no, we finally used a couple, some more breakdancing meeples, which was just as much fun as last time, and some Pathfinder Adventure card game. And that's the one I would like to say a bit more about. Yeah, we're finally finally getting into it and, and, and getting through the Pathfinder world now. Yeah, a little bit more. So um, now, first off, I have to say, sitting down to play Pathfinder card game after not playing for a number of weeks was rough. Um, Every time we talk about this game, we talk about just how crunchy it is and how fiddly it is. And those fiddly bits are easy to forget if you're not playing the game regularly. Um, I found myself wishing we had a glossary style book, right? Like in Jaws of the Lion, where you could quickly look up rules. Now, thankfully, there is an index, and that helped, but it just would have been nice to look up things alphabetically. And I know I used to curse Fantasy Flight Games for the two books, but I find the more I got used to that format, the more I miss it. Yeah, no, there's something to be said about just breaking out the stuff that you're going to need all the time and having it right there accessible. Yeah. So once we got past a few forgotten rule hurdles and discovered there's player aids, which we had totally missed our first two plays. It ends up on the back of the scourge cards, which are like status effects. The back of those have player walk through the turn. So that was cool. Totally missed those the first two plays. Uh, the game flowed pretty good once we got going. Um, the adventure we played was uh, number 1A, which was the official start of the Dragon's Demand Adventure Path. Uh, this was interesting because here you have the first official adventure, right? Like there were some tutorial scenarios we did. This broke away from what I thought the goal of every adventure was. Like when you read the rule book, it says, this is what you do in the Pathfinder Adventure card game is you put out a number of locations, you search for them to try to find the villain, you block off the other locations, you can trap the villain, you beat him up. First scenario, the box, there's no villain. I'm just like, whoa, okay. Uh, You just had to close all three locations. Well, all the locations and with two players, that's three. We managed to get through this one pretty quickly. Um, Surprisingly, I actually found this easier than the first tutorial mission was interesting this actually reminds me a little bit of what i was finding when i was exploring uh the online version of the lord of the rings uh card game Mm -hmm. uh it was very you know you know the the first adventure did things a little differently and was easier than i expected based on on the tutorial and is the lord of the rings considered an adventure card game because it might use similar mechanics i'm Uh, not sure i believe it is it's a because I know there were a number of games that came out with similar mechanics. Like, I yeah. have a Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay one, but it's very different from this Pathfinder one. Right. So, one neat thing I do want to bring up, um, I know our episode's a little longer, so I'm not going to get into details, but it's how good Mike Selinker, the designer of this Pathfinder Adventure card game core set, 
did with making these cards tell you a story, a Pathfinder, a D&D style story. Now, an example of this, right? So we have these three places we're investigating. The story is that this wizard's tower just blew up. One of the places we're investigating is a ruined tower. And you're going through, you're finding stuff, and eventually you're going to find the henchman. And if you defeat it, you can try to close the tower. Mechanically, that's what's called closing the location. And you can do it by defeating the henchman or go through the entire deck. Well, when you close the tower in this particular scenario, you pull the danger. And the danger this time is collapse. So once you look at it and piece it together, what this represents is that as you finish exploring the ruined tower, it starts to collapse and you need to make some checks to get out unharmed. And I just thought that was mechanically neat that you could tell that once we're done, that's now collapsing and we need to escape. And I thought that was neat how well they tied into the story by just what are basically just a bunch of mechanical cards. Yeah, no, absolutely. You can, uh, it's, it's clear that they've, they've thought it through and, 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 and given you a game that's more than just a card game. Oh, look, it's, yeah. you know, I cast this spell and this happens because that's the card I had. No, no, they, they've, they've put some thought into it all. That was neat. You end up telling a pretty interesting story when you look at the details that way. Now, I am looking forward to exploring more of the Pathfinder Adventure card game, more in the coming weeks, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later, so we don't forget all the rules again and need to refresh the rule book between sessions. Now, there was, of course, one other game we played last week, and that was Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. Last Friday, Deanna and I hammered through the final tutorial scenario, scenario number five, took out the first boss, and finally got to level up. Now, at this point, going forward, the training wheels are off, and we are using the full Jaws of the Lion rules. Now, as for Jaws of the Lion, our next actual play video, Scenario 2, goes live tomorrow on YouTube. And be sure to join us Friday night, 8.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, where Deanna and I will be moving on to Scenario 6. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? Uh, next week, I'm hoping to get in some place of Sanctum. This is a Diablo board game in every way but the name. Um, so we need to get in a couple more plays of that, and I'd like to review that next Wednesday. And I'm finally, we're going we're gonna to get the Eminent Domain Exotica review done. This is the last expansion I own for Eminent Domain. It's not the last one that's published. I don't have the final one, but it's the last one I own. That's just a, we've owed that one for a long time. I think it's time to just hammer through that one and get it out there. I will say right now it's a, it's, it's the same as the last one where, wow, it adds more to the game and it has a learning curve, but it's solid. Plus, as just mentioned, I'd like to play some more Pathfinder before we forget what we're doing. There we go. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Brian Kurtz. Thanks, Brian. Yuho Rutilla. Thank you. Jeff Seuss. Thanks, Jeff. Kator. That that sounds familiar. I like like something from a long time ago. Graham Barnett. Thanks. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and it's time to drop the portcullis. Though the doors for the lobby are closed and the portcullis is down, you can always find us across the web and social media. As Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you think the content we're providing would like to continue our so support our continued efforts, please consider tipping your bellhops through our Patreon, patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. And well, our that, actual plays on Fridays at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. And be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.